Joe Rogan Podcast, check it out. The Joe Rogan Experience. Train by day, Joe Rogan Podcast by night, all day. Let's go, Shimmy. Shimmy, Shimmy, Shimmy. Most people don't know about Shimmy. They don't mm-hmm. know about your alter ego. No. Well, yeah, you were the one who brought it out of me. <laughs> we were, right? Well, we would do shows. We would do shows in New York, and you would go full Shimmy. <laughs> I'd be on the side of the, side of the stage yelling out, Shimmy! <laughs> well, when we first started, by the way, we we did the Joe Rogan Experience 30 years ago, right? Yeah. It just wasn't millions just of people. Out. Not listening. Exactly. Just playing pool. Um, you, you, I remember Sussman brought you into town. You started at Nick's? Was it Nick's or? I started at Stitches in Boston. Stitches. And then uh, I was like two years in when I met you. And then uh, I think we met at Eastside, mm-hmm. which was awesome. What great a great club. club. What a great club. I was club just there. Was. Shout out to Richie Manervini. Yes, my man. He, he was, it was the greatest, the greatest place to go. I remember, uh, it would be a line around the block, two shows like on a Wednesday night. It was insane yeah. comedy then. That place the was golden a age of comedy at the time, 1990. Yes. Oh, my God. It was incredible back then, 91-ish. I started in 89. I think I met you in, what is it, 90? 91, maybe? 90, 91? Yeah, somewhere, around somewhere there. in there. Uh, and I was, you know, I was following everybody. That was my thing. Like, I... I was being the stand-up comedian with the, you know, the jacket sleeves pushed up and the, the, <laughs> the bolo tie. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I, just, I was just that straight thing. And you came into town, and we were like, "Who is this dude?" Like you just didn't care about anything, and it was like you've always remained the same. And it was just incredible to watch. We were like, "Whoa, he just doesn't care." And that's what you were. You would work with me on that. You would be like, "Brother, you can't." be like you're handing out a platter of food for these people like do what you want to do and i was like i just gotta get good yeah i gotta wrap my head around that you're right you know i just try to, <laughs> I, I, would, I would just try to make the audience so happy you're like stop it stop it and you gotta let go and you'd get me going crazy <laughs> i get all fired up there i'd be like yelling at people they'd be like whoa it's like why well, maybe we bring it back a little bit but it was different man it really was it was it, it really taught me to most of all, to be comfortable in front of an audience and not care about them. You know, it's, I still, I literally battle with it to this day. Yeah. That anxiety of, oh gosh, I get nervous and I start overthinking things. So, um, but it really helped me to say, like, just do what you do. And it's almost like the, because the audience is like a dog, right? They, they, they sense fear. You know, they 100%. sense. 100%. Yeah. They're animals. Just yeah. like we are. We're yes. all animals. That's right. And it's like, they know when, you know, and if you're comfortable, even if you're faking it, they'll go with you. You do a joke and you're confident. They'll laugh just because they think it's funny. You know, they look around and everybody's like, oh, it must be funny because he's just got confidence by it. And you had that confidence always, man. You were always insanely intense and just never looked back. And way to go, man. Way to go for you, too. You just always needed a hype man. Mm-hmm. You, you, you just need someone to, like, let you go. Like, give him the green light. Give him yes. the green light. It's so funny. You're right. You're right. Yeah, you just needed a hype man. You were the one who did it for me in Montreal, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember that? Yeah. Going this place? By the way, do you remember the beer we would drink? There were two kinds of this beer. I can't remember this Canadian beer. I- I've been racking my brain to think about it. It was like there was like a gold version of it and like an like an amber. Uh, and it was just the greatest stuff. And we get fired up up there. And I loved it, man. I loved going to that Montreal Comedy Festival. Oh, it was the best. Back it, when it was, I think it's gone under. I think they did just announced they're going bankrupt. Oh, really? Yeah, unfortunately. See, well, she'd tell people what it was. Oh, so yeah. what it was during our time, when we were young, was the Montreal Comedy Festival was where young comedians would go up and you could kind of get a deal. And yes. that's where you got the deal to do the King Queens. Well, I got the deal to do at NBC. Right. And, oh, then, that, and, and that then turned in. Yeah, turned that, once in, that failed, yeah. that went into to, to CBS. But once up. you get in, the thing about the people should know, like in the 90s, there was this thing that was happening where everybody looked at a comedian like, this could be the next Roseanne, this could be the next Tim Allen, right. this could be the next Seinfeld. So every time they looked at you, they're like, what do you got? What right. do you got for me? And the agents would try to put it together as a sitcom. Yes. And they had this showcase called the Montreal Comedy Festival, the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival. And it was... 
the most insane thing. You would go there and it would change your life. You could have one set, one 15 minute set, and all of a sudden you got a half a million dollars. A hundred percent. You have one thing, one set that pops and people talking about, there's a buzz, yeah. and it's like you're in, you're set. And they have bidding wars. Yes. So like CBS would be, Fox would be, they would all be <laughs> throwing in. And, you know, there's guys who walked, do you remember Chicken? Chicken was the crazy guy. Yes. 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 Chicken got the deal that killed the deal. Yes. Yes. He got like uh, 800000 or something. It was some crazy money or a mil- I don't know what it some was. Some nutty but, amount of money. But he had no act, right? It was after that. They thought he was. He just tricked everybody. He did. And I don't know how he did it, and I wonder if he had a hype man, if you could have kept tricking people. Yeah. Like, he... Maybe he just went off the rails with anxiety when success starts. Because that's one of the things that does happen. And I've talked about it. I think everybody admits it. You, when it first starts happening, you think it's going to go away. You get super anxiety ridden. You, 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 you feel like an imposter. And you like you can't be- like you'd show up on the set and you're like, are they kicking me out? Like, I'm still here? My bud, I'm telling you, I've... I still deal with that. I'm not even kidding. Yeah. You obviously don't, and you haven't. I do, long... though. Do I you do, really? Though. Yeah, I do. I just ignore it. I tell it to shut the fuck up. Well, that's what you got to do, I guess. Yeah. And that's what I don't do enough because I start thinking, and I get thinking, and I start overthinking both sides. I'm like, oh, gosh, what if this happens or this that? This means something to this day. Yeah. Like, if I'm doing, a, like, a theater and it's my people, you know, and I know that they're coming to pay to see me, I, 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 I'm pretty confident. I feel like I'm going to do well. But if I do a club that they don't know me oh, or something, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. You know, like I did a, a corporate gig uh, like a month ago, like in Miami. And I was like, you know, I was like, oh boy, because corporate gigs, you know, they can go either way. And it's, they can be horrible. Well, I get there. It's in Miami. Really good looking people. Everybody, it's in a lobby of a hotel. And I'm, I thought this was in a the theater. I'm there. And it's a good, and I'm, now I'm getting worried. I'm like, I got to do how much? And they're like, you got to do an hour. And then I find out. <laughs> Nobody there wants to see me. The woman who was the, the like CEO of this company was it was her birthday and she liked me, so she brought me in to, to for all her friends to see. Dude, I'm sitting in the lobby I'm, and I'm finding all this information out as I'm sitting there, and I started. I'm not kidding. I started. I've never had a panic attack. I start going. What, 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 what do you mean? She has, they, nobody else knows I'm here or this or that or they don't know. They go. No, no, no. They don't know. You know, this is a company, and you know. And I'm looking in the room. I, it's in the lobby. I can see through like a little glass uh, window, and they're drinking, they're having, they're talking at table. We're set up for comedy too, just like round tables, uh, booths, like not even facing you. And I'm on. I see a postage stamp of a stage that I got to stand on, and I'm like, oh my gosh. So I start hyperventilating. I really do. I go. I wish I was going. So I start going. I, I can't. I, I can't. Can't do this. I'm talking to Skylar, my my assistant buddy. You know, he's 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 helping me out here, and I'm like, hey, just tell them we we can't do it. And he's like, what are you talking about? I go, just tell them I, we're gonna give them the money back. We're just not gonna do it. We don't need to do this. I don't want to do it. It's just not gonna go well. And I started really panicking, and then they started going up. She's up on stage now, introducing me, and I go, oh my gosh, we're going. Oh my gosh. So I start f- freaking out. <gasps> Heart is going like, exactly. <laughs> I've been so doing comedy anxiety. for thirty years. I've been doing stand up. I go, I don't need this. I'm ready to call Sussy and go. I don't want. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do it. I don't. Uh, need... I get up there and go. I go. Just get him with that first joke. If you do, you settle it. Because if you don't, you know, if they don't buy you on that first joke, you're fucked. You're gone. You're fucked. You're gone for an hour. For an hour, you're gone. You know. Oh, oh gosh. And they're not oh. even listening. They're loud when they bring me up. And when I came up, it wasn't even like they all turned and went nuts. But uh, I got him with. I don't know what I said. I just said one joke about the lady thanking me. You know, thanking for bringing me up. And and uh, I just won them over. In one little sweet way, and and they they turned and they clapped and they laughed at one thing, and then I went into another joke very gingerly, just kind of going this that, and they laughed at that, and I go okay, I just settled in, I go I got them, and Ooh. they were great, they were great, they were really great, and I was sweating the whole time, I really feeling the sweat, you know what I'm saying? It, it was like it was it was it was rough, but uh, that's yeah. so nerve wracking. Oh. I'm glad it worked out great. But... I hate it. But I, I just I ran into Sandler when I missed you at the airport. I ran into Sandler. He was just telling me about the fucking worst corporate gig that he just had yes. to do. Yeah, he, I called him about. He had the same <laughs> thing. He had the same thing. So it's nice to see somebody like that has it too. Yeah, a guy like him can still eat dick. I talked to Billy Joel, and he says he literally he was like, "I've gone through those." I'm like, "You?" But when you're playing music, it's different. Yeah, man. but they'll throw that Saudi money. At he, you. Yeah, he threw crazy money yeah. at him, and he did a, a corporate gig or whatever it was. 
And he says they weren't even listening. They turned away, and they oh. and, and it's like just you and the band, and you just go, let's go, boys. You know, and they play. Dana White had a 40th birthday party, mm -hmm. and uh, Stone Temple Pilots played, and it was insane. These dudes played like it was a packed arena. Where? It was at a fucking conference room in a hotel somewhere. They didn't care. They, they didn't, didn't give a fuck. They had a, a beautiful stage set up. The stage was set up nice. But, like, you know, all of a sudden they were like, hey, everybody, Stone Temple Pilots. And then they fucking just, I am, I am, I am, I am. They just, just went into, yeah. F the, I, I was so impressed by his ability to perform. I mean, there's like, it took a while for people to even filter to the dance floor in front of them and, and watch the show. This dude did it like there was 50,000 people out there. It was incredible. I mean, he didn't back off at all. He who cares less has more power. It's oh. literally like, it, that's it. It's, uh, I'm going around yeah. with a tray. Of, like, you guys yeah. think this is funny? He's like, I don't care. He and didn't it's like, give a fuck. And everybody jumps in. Full commitment. You know, when someone just fully commits to something like that, it's very inspiring. And you'll, you'll never forget that. Because if you never see anybody fully commit, that's why you never see great comics ever that exist where there's no other great comics. The best comic in the world never comes out of Tallahassee. Right. Out of nowhere, no scene. We all need to see other people do something special. And if you're lucky, you live in New York or you live in L.A. or now you live in Texas and you get to see these killers all the time. Yeah. And then you get a sense of it. So you know, like, where the watermark is. Right. Until you see a guy jump in front of a fucking 40th birthday party <laughs> who's a, a, a platinum selling artist in this insane band that's iconic and perform like they're performing in front of an arena. He had the bullhorn and everything. Oh, my God. It was incredible. It was incredible. The show was amazing. Wow. It was so good. But it was like that fucking guy worked for his money. Like he 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 doesn't he didn't have like a I'll give him a seven tonight. Right. I'm gonna give him an eight. Every night. Based a on 10. the yeah, the area we were playing. It's like guns blazing. That's the way you gotta be, man. I gotta I gotta do it. Yeah, you need a hype man. I need a hype man. <laughs> I'm doing a uh, You're two different guys. I am. You're you, you know with me. no hype. You know, <laughs> you know me. If yes. I'm left to my own devices, I, I am I, I go into a little hole. I do. It's my whole life. Everything. Sports, yeah. everything. But this is the thing. Like I have uh I'm playing a first my first arena coming up and I'm freaking out. I've never done that have, before. Are you doing it in the round? No. That's the way to do it. You know why? Well, it's this a little is, late for that. This is it's okay. You'll still have a great time. They're still great. The, the arenas are great. They're fun. It's a wild experience. But the round is the best because it's actually intimate in the strangest way. Because, I've done the Westbury Music fa Fair. Yeah. facing everybody. Yes. So all the people see each other, and you, they're all in it together. I love that. I love that idea. But I, does the the stage does it turn? No, you walk around. I used to do the one, you know, the Westbury Music Fair. Oh, it walks, it spins for you. It would for spin you. for you, and you yeah. wouldn't even know where the hell you are, and then you have to walk <laughs> off. It's the awkward walk off. You where don't you, know where the stairs you, are. You don't know where they are. It moved, and everybody <laughs> shifted, and you, you don't know who you're looking at. You have to get, find some distinctive person in the yes. audience that sits on the stage. That's, that That's big the guy, guy is my marker yeah. right there. The one in Phoenix spins around too. What's that? The Celebrity Theater. I you can been turn there. it on or off. Really? Yeah, that's a good one too. That's a because it's a comedy club, but it's in the round. Right. It's like a two thousand seat comedy club in the round. That's what it's like. I would feel guilty like half the crowd is looking. You know, I'd be thinking right. now. I got another thing to think about. They've seen my ass for right. you know, the last forty minutes. I got to spend. You know, yeah. and, and do you, you set up rotate. a joke over here and deliver the punchline there, or how do you break it up? Well, you have giant screens. So the oh, thing about good. the arena is they have massive screens. So if for some reason, like, you know, uh, we did these ones in Ohio uh, and uh, Chappelle came down and it was it was very interesting to watch because they didn't know he was supposed to be there. And uh, it was my show and uh, Tony didn't know whether he was going to bring Dave up or me because Dave hadn't gotten there yet. Oh, wow. And so it's like <clears throat> Tony's on stage. And he's got like five minutes before he should go on stage, and all of a sudden Dave rolls up, posse, fucking limo. Yeah, this is a guy who doesn't overthink things. <laughs> he you just, don't need the hype man. He just strolled in. Yeah, and uh, and and he just came to say hi, and and he's always like, "Should I go up?" I go, "What do you mean, should you go up?" I yeah. go, "Go up, let's go." He goes, "When?" I go, "You'll be up in five minutes." He goes, "Well, let's have a drink." So we had a drink. And then we're sitting in the green room, and I go, dude, he's got about one minute to go. I go, I'll walk out there with you. 
because he needs to know that it's not me that he's bringing up. Dave. I see, right. So he starts bringing me up. This is one of my best friends, one of my favorite. Pe- and then I'm like flashing the light, and he sees Dave, and the crowd slowly starts to realize it's Dave. Oh my! When gosh. they see me and Dave walk to the stage, and by the time he says Ohio Zone, Dave Chappelle, it is one full minute of a standing ovation. One full minute. Yeah. So he takes this victory lap around the stage for like one, f- I mean, a full minute, man. It was, I, I filmed it. I put it up on my Instagram. That's, <clears throat> it's insane. It's inspiring. I mean, and Tony so were just crazy. looking at each other and looking around going, wow. Right. It just felt special. It felt like special that you could be there. Like, wow. And then he goes, OH. And he puts the, the, oh, the no. mic out. And and it's just, even bigger. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was insane. It was insane. It was so fucking cool because he's from Ohio. You're right. You know, he lives in, in uh, Yellow Springs, which is like oh, right outside of Dayton. Goodness. So it's like for him to, to go there like that, and, but to be in the round. See, the round is everybody sees everybody. Yes. It's not just you facing this crowd, and then you're in the crowd, and they're there. In the round, it seems like everyone's all in this together. It's, it's intimate so in much a special better. way. Yeah, and the screens are giant, so you just walk around. But like when Dave was facing that way, I'd see his face on the screen. You just It's not bad. It's like it's still awesome because you're there. And everybody just kind of walks around. You just get used to walking around. Nobody really stands still right. and points in one direction right. in an in arena in the round. That would be rude. Well, the screens help. I mean, that oh, is true. massive. That, yeah. They're everywhere. They're giant. They're yeah. 50 feet wide. And they're fucking everywhere. So that's it makes it easy. It's well, an experience. I would love to be in there. I think I'm in... Denver and in Salt Lake City, where I'm worried about this, my first arenas, and it's like ah, you're gonna have fun. Eek, I don't it's know, man. It's gonna be fun. You just, I- it's gonna be fun. Though this is Dave. Here it is. Listen to this. It's like a fight. Oh my god. I mean, you literally can't even hear him bring up no. Dave Chappelle. Look at this. Look at this. Oh, that's insane. No. <laughs> no. It's like, that's it the sickest amazing. thing I've ever seen. It was like, I felt like we were seeing the Beatles. I felt like it was like Hendrix got on stage. Well done for you, bringing him up before you. I mean, that's insane. It was awesome. That's incredible. It was so fun. It was so <laughs> <laughs> But that's the thing. It's like, but I do that all the time. You know, when I'm at the club, mm-hmm. I'll have five, six guys that are going on in front of me. And they're all headliners. I'm, See, doing, that's I'm why going on stage an hour and a half into the show. I would, again, my theaters, um, I'd be comfortable. Your club, I would be afraid. I'd be afraid because you got such heavy hitters, and I come up and I'm talking about no, weird no, no, little no, no. observational stuff, and it's like, whoa. No, I, it would no. get in my head. It would. It, no, there's got a lot of weird observational comedians kill there. It's a fun place. Like, Duncan kills there. And, you know, and we're. it's all just, it's all great. It's all a bunch of different, but for me, it's like, to, to have a, I want the audience to see like the best possible show they could see. So they're, they're going to see Ron White, they're going to wow. see Shane Gillis and Tony wow. Hinchcliffe and Brian Simpson. And, That's insane. And all these monsters that come into town. Like in any given week, it's Krista Stefano or fucking Dave Smith. or It's like there's so many killers. How, how, how often during the week are you, are you there? And how often like are guys working out their stuff there? Well, are it's there different open nights? seven nights a week. Seven nights a seven week. Seven nights a week, two shows each night in each room. Except for uh, Mondays and Sundays, which are open mic nights. So open mic night, there's uh, a show in the small room. There's only one show. But then there's uh, at least one show in the main room that's a regular show. Like right. Regular comedians. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. And it's um, two shows a night in each room. So four shows a night. 
How how big are e- each room? One's two fifty, and one's about one ten to one twenty. Is there? Do you feel a difference? Or oh no? yeah yeah yeah. The little one's super intimate. The little one is like um, if you remember the belly room at the comedy store. It's like the belly room in the original room had a baby, and that's the little one. Wow. It's like medium size little, and then the big room is like the co- the original room and the main room at the comedy store had a baby. That's what it's like. And you, when you're trying out stuff, people going up there with like notepads and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Christina Pazitsky does it all the time. She okay. goes up with a notepad. A lot of guys go up with notepads. Yeah, it's like if you got some new shit you're working on, Segura's, he goes up with notepads. <clears throat> if you have new shit. Right. Because you want to be able to remember. You don't want to fuck up the bit. And the, and the audience kind of appreciates, like, oh, this is so new. They feel that it's. They have to yeah, look at it. Yeah, yeah, it's not polished. And then Brian Simpson hosts this show called Bottom of the Barrel. And that's a really fun show where you go up there and you have no material. And you just reach into this b- whiskey barrel. And there's a bunch of different premises that the audience members have written down. And you pull it out, you open it up. And you do a bit on that? Yeah, you just start talking shit. Yeah. But the audience knows that's what you're doing. So right. because they know Should what they you're doing, you it's really little, fun. Yeah, yeah they, they, they're not expecting right. polished material. Everybody knows what the show is. The show is fucking around. And maybe... If I was to go there and do my <laughs> act, I would pretend like I pulled, pulled that out, <laughs> out of the whiskey bottle first, or the, the barrel, and then... Uh... Did you ever notice? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. But you can, like, if you have a bit on a subject and you just tell them, I actually have a bit on the subject, and then you can do it. Or, right. You know, and there's also, like, sometimes... There's like there's the other night. There's something that I've been writing that I've never done on stage before, and just by sheer coincidence, the same subject was something that I pulled out of the piece of paper. Are you kidding? Yeah. So it was like, oh, it was robot fuck dolls. Right. So, which is like, you know, you can see. I have a coming. whole chunk on that. <laughs> I just, I got. Now I'm gonna throw it away because you're working on it. I don't want to. But it was one of those moments where uh, I'm like, oh. I was like last night. I spent two hours writing stuff on this. Right. So let's just run with it here. See what happens. Have you ever had a dip? Because they must go nuts when they see you, right? Yeah. And then, because back on Long Island, I'll work out at a little club like Governors. You know, you know. I don't know if you remember that. Oh yeah, Governors yeah. Levittown. Yeah, and I'll go out there, and I'm hometown boy, and I go up there, and they go nuts for, for like a minute or so. Not like that, but like they go crazy. It's fun to see you, and then. Within two minutes, if I don't, like, they're ordering sausage and <laughs> rolls, and it's like, they're, 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 they're talking, and it's, it's, it's like putting weight on the bar. It's yeah. like, I'm like, whoa. Yeah, well, New York audiences, too, they just, they don't have much patience for bullshit. It's a, it's a good place to start comedy. New York and Boston, both good places to start comedy because people don't have any patience for bullshit. Right. Get yeah yeah we're happy to see you, but yeah. come with the jokes. Exactly. Let's go. Come on. I'm here exactly. to I, I'm here to laugh. Yeah. I do a lot of writing while I have a tour. Like if I have a tour in in the theaters, you know, where I'll try to if I have a set theme set, I'll try to add some stuff in there mm-hmm. for the next one. Have you ever done yeah. that? Do you ever? Yeah. Yeah. When you're doing a lot of shows, it's it's great. Yeah. Because you kind of get a sense of where you could stick stuff in, and you, start you always saying, have the safety net of I can go here if right. it's going nowhere. Yeah, yeah, that's my problem. That's what I do too. I'll I'll write a huge chunk on something, and won't know when to bail on it if it's not going. Like you, you know, it's mm-hmm. dependent on this thing. I got to follow through with it now, and if they're not in, <laughs> they don't buy in right away. I'm like, wow, I got three more minutes of this stuff. Well, oftentimes, I've, I've realized it's because I didn't buy in. Right. That's what it is mostly with me. If I'm entering a bit you're not like, committed, oh, or I you're... didn't want to be talking about this. I wish I shouldn't didn't bring this one up. Like if I ever get to that place, like you just have to fight off that thought. There's this thought that comes into your mind like, oh, why did I bring this up? I don't want to do this bit. You can't, but you can't say, you know what, fuck that bit. Yeah. Because then the audience would be like, what? Yes. Yes. No. So you just have to never let yourself get to the mindset where you're like, I don't want to do this. You got to remember there were there was something whatever the subject is there was something about that subject that when you initially started writing a joke about it it was resonating right. with you and you were like what the fuck is this right. but if you hear it too many times it's like anything else you get tired of it you, it loses its luster but that's just a mental weakness you just have to realize just like get your your head wrapped around that you can't allow yourself to think that way. And surely this thought originally was valid because that's why you're so excited about it. That's why you wrote a bit about it. The audience doesn't know that you've said it a hundred times over the last year right. or more. They, they just want to hear it. Right. So they want, to want, they want to hear it from fresh eyes. So you have to put yourself in fresh eyes. Right. You have to be able to do that. And that's the trick. And well, it's, not, it's not like you're faking it either. You have to actually 
really be thinking about it like you think about it if you want it to work at the best you know like when a bit is really sharp yeah you're on you have to be thinking about it as you're like enthusiastically as it's coming to you as yeah, you, yeah. you gotta be actually engaged right. with each part of it while it's happening well when I write a new bit and if I write a, a big chunk and it's too much, I'll go up with too much stuff and I didn't rehearse it like because words are so efficient. You say one word or you're repeating a word, mm -hmm. it stumbles you up and then you're like, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, and then it, it kind of blows it for this, the yeah. next part of the bit. So it's like, I, I got to work more at um, like really rehearsing my bits, you know, just really getting through how I'm going to speak, how I'm going to, you know, because yeah. I, I stumble all the time. Well, the, the problem is then you start thinking about it, right? you know, and with new bits, they're just not etched into your brain yet. So as you go up with them, you're like, they're like little Bambi walking on ice, yeah. you know, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it's not yeah. steady. Yeah. That's, it's, yeah, it's, but that's what like small shows are good for. That's what fucking around is good for. Right. And that's what also is like, that's when it's really important that you're inspired by whatever this idea is. If I'm inspired by the idea, I can always talk about it. Right. Like, if there's a thing that I can get behind where I'll go, oh, you, so, you explain this to me. And then if I'm in that mindset, I can make it happen. But I just can never let myself not be interested in what I'm talking about. I, right. That's just, that's a problem that people have and that I've had. And it's, it's just, but you have to recognize that it's like throwing a toaster in a bathtub. Well, what I'm, trying to do now is because I really I used to write just every it was just separate jokes joke 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 mm -hmm. here and every time I would bring up a new subject it was like the audience is starting from scratch again to mm -hmm. try to catch up and it's exhausting to try to understand so if I if I try to put it in a story or like a, a theme to yeah. my set at least they kind of know what's happening before you know so they know oh this was this is you know you tend to do these type of things and then you talk about something like that they, they go with you it's like you're not yeah. starting a you know it's easy to, what is it, push a moving Momentum. car? Momentum, yeah. exactly. And that's been working better for me because I, you know, I saw everything was like just isolated bits of jokes that I would put, you know, and I'd go, I just put them in anywhere, put a lazy uh, connective tissue to it, you know, mm -hmm. and it would be like, it would work. You get to laugh, but it's like there's no, you know, yeah. building. That's why I always admired guys like Stephen Wright who oh, do those man. non sequiturs. I'm like, how do you do that? Mm hmm. And how do you write? Right. God, that's going to be so hard to write. Um, who's the guy uh, died? He's such Mitch a Hedberg? Yes. Same thing. Yes. Yeah, same thing. So great. Non sequiturs. Just yeah. didn't Amazing. Matter. And you were with him every yeah. And that's what made it even funnier. You know, God, it's like. Who, who does that now? Are there any non sequitur guys that just go joke to? I guess Jimmy Carr's kind of non sequitur. But some guys just, they're just one bit to the next, yeah. one subject to the next. And with Mitch Hedberg, it was always like super ridiculous. Like, and and Stephen Wright, same thing. Everything was really ridiculous. And that became something that actually elevated it. To, like, right? You yeah. Know what I mean, like it was the they weren't storytellers, you know? Right. That's yeah. It was so part. Funny. It was part of the fun. So out of it. Yeah. Yeah. That this guy was <laughs> like out, uh, out of nowhere. Somebody asked me, "Do I want a frozen banana?" I said, "No, but I want a regular banana later." So yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's the best. What a fucking great He's the joke. best. Oh, he was amazing, man. Oh. That was a guy, like, he just didn't want to kick heroin. Yeah. They were trying to get him to kick heroin. He's like, uh-uh, I like it. Is that what it was? He just <laughs> he liked it. He just wasn't going to kick it. He it was hospitalized while we were on the man show, and Doug Stanhope and he and, and Mitch were very close. And I, you know, I admired him deeply as a comedian. Oh. He's a, he was a great comic, man. And he, that was when he was, I think he was hospitalized with gangrene. Yeah, because he was shooting it, you know, allegedly. Hey. It's um, heroin is a scary one <clears throat> because it seems to touch this part of people that makes them very creative and very the, like the, it resonates with people. Like so much music that's great, it's made on heroin. But God, what a curse! What a curse! When you watch someone who gets uh, caught in the opiate web. It's so terrifying. It's so sad to see. Yeah. And when you have someone who's just like this, I mean, imagine the kind of bits that Mitch Hedberg could have come up with oh, over all these talent, decades man. after that. What a talent. Yeah. And he was all non sequitur. It was all one Every, bit leads into the next I love bit, it. <laughs> Double I, Tree Hotel. Yep. And <laughs> it I love just, it. I love it. Yeah. I love that humor, man. Just He, he was amazing. 
Yeah, he was. He was. It's just, um, you know, that guy had a, a hard time in the beginning because people didn't know what he was doing. So he would go on after, like, these high-energy, like, music acts. Yeah. Guys would sing songs and shit, and they'd have, like, a dirty rap, and they'd just bring up Mitch it. Hedberg. Yeah, and, and it'd be different like that. in deaf. Yeah. And you're in the middle of Ohio or right. wherever. And, so they're know, not used to that, and they, no. they want the song. And they the... don't know who you are. You're just the headliner. Oh, he's on Evening at the Improv? Okay. Right. And then they go to see you. They really didn't know. They just said, oh, look, MTV Half Hour Comedy Hour. He must be good. And then they go to right. the local comedy club because it's a thing to do on a Friday night. But when they don't know you, like, th that's one thing uh, th that is, you know, made it a little bit easier is when people are coming to see you and they know you as opposed to who's this next guy. And it's kind yes. of like just make me way, laugh. Way, way, way right? easier. But also comes with a trap because they'll laugh at stuff that's not that good. Right. Like the we've all seen guys who only perform for their crowds only like in, in big places like they only do theaters, only do their crowds only like that act can get soft. Yeah. It can get soft and still work. Right. Because they're not being tested. They're not performing with other comics all the time. Well, you see a lot of these guys now that are developing an act because they did something on like Instagram or whatever whatever like they developed these audiences mm -hmm. that you know, they, they get popular, yeah, and then they put together an act. They go and the and the clubs are like, well, let's put this guy up, you know, yeah, and um, they sell out like crazy because you know they they they, they got a big following, yeah, but it's not like working your stand up, man. It's a different game. Well, there's also a lot of guys who do crowd control, like they do crowd work stuff, like it's like uh, just fucking around with the crowd, and that's most of these clips. You're seeing a lot of guys. Who put up clips of cloud work because that way they don't have to crowd work because you don't have to burn your material. We're just talking to the crowd, you right? Just talk to them. It's, it's fine. That can go bad. It can go bad, but if you do it enough and you get and some you get funny moments, it. right? You know, like you Andrew Schultz net. has a lot of great moments. Right. He's really good at it. And you take those clips, and that way you're putting shit up, but you're not burning any of your jokes. The problem is some of those guys can only do that. Schultz is a great comic. Like he could do right. great bits. He could do great. I mean, he can do anything. Right. But some of these guys are only good at talking to the audience. And then when they have to do, did you ever notice? Right. And everybody's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> What's the, this? the audience can feel the shift yeah. when I go back to my own material. Like, yeah. oh, you wrote this. Yeah, what is this you whack ass yes. bullshit yeah. that you've been thinking about all day? Yeah. You know, you're you're better off responding. Like there's there's certain guys that like their thing is really just talking to the crowd. And that's that's a different thing. It's a great thing. It's really great when someone's funny at it, but it's also a different thing than the actual jokes. See, I, I, I fear that. Like, I don't like doing that. Like, so I've built my act with the 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 the, the speed of it that it like no one has the chance to get in and ask a question or you right, know or heckle right. or whatever. You know, you you build this shell yeah. around you, so like <laughs> it's just not enough time. You can't even get it in. So if someone says something, it's like you're off them yeah, quick. You know, exactly. Because I don't want to have to depend on doing that, going what and stopping and then trying to get back to the bit that you were, you know, doing. Yeah, that you don't need that. But some people like it. Some people like to interact with the crowd. It just—it's also it, it. It's extra juice, right? It is. The audience realizes it's happening. It's live, real. Like, it is. Whoa, yeah, this yeah. Is, this is crazy. And then if you get good one-liners, you know, oh. in the moment, it's a great tool to have. I wish oh, I could, yeah. you know, depend on it more. Do you talk to the crowd at all? I do. Occasionally, you have to. And then at the comedy store, you had to. The comedy store, you had to. The comedy store, for the longest time, had zero crowd control. They do a good job now of policing the room. But back then, there was it was comics that were the door people. It was comics that seated people. It was the comics that took the, the, the money at the cash register. It was yeah. comics working there. And they were all like, yeah. they didn't want to do that job. So they were the worst bouncers. Right. And nobody ever quieted the audience. It was just you need to learn how to do it in the fire. But you toughen up that way. Like you, you build a. You, you understand how to go with the flow. Right. You know, and some, but some people don't do that. And they did not like the comedy store for that reason. Like they just go up there and they like to have a slow pace and do their bits and build. That's me. You know, That's like, more me. Yeah. I would have been, I, I was always afraid of the comedy store. It's just when you go up, like if, if, you know, someone like Adam Egid is, who's brilliant at scheduling and really understands talent and where people go, you just want to put them in the right place. You don't want to put him after a music act. Right. You know, like, that's the death. That the, is absolute the death. The death is the guy who has the funny songs. Right. You're not following right. that. <laughs> you just see the, the guitar in the back and the guy's, no! you know, 
tuning it up and you're like, oh no, when, when is he on? And no. he's like, he's on next, then you're up, then, you know, no. it's like, no. No, the guy oh. with the guitar always ruined the oh. show. <laughs> they always oh, killed. No. They would kill and you could follow him. Yep. Yeah. I, Musical acts, raps, anybody could do a rap. Remember Red Johnny and the Round Guy? Oh, yeah. Those guys would do that rap. You're done. It was the show was over, bitch. You see them go. You, yeah. I go, I'm getting in my car. I'm leaving. I'll see you later. I go. I'm not. There's no need for me to be here. It's crazy how like a, a like a song or a, just like a funny song. It just yeah. it tops everything. Yeah. It really Who does. was that guy that used to be on Doctor Demento? There was that guy that used to have dirty songs back in the day, and he was famous. He would tour around with dirty songs. John Valby. Yes. Thank you. Yes. That guy. Doctor, Remember that yes. guy? Dr. Dirty. Dr. Dirty. Yeah. That's right. He would light up a room. And you, yeah. Light up a room. <laughs> yeah. You're not going on after no. him. No. It's over. And everybody knew who he was. And you would hear his songs on like Dr. Demento. Remember yeah. like Late yes. Night on the Radio? Yeah. You would hear his songs? Yeah. He would tour and do just dirty blowjob songs and everybody would go, yeah. Rah! that yeah. guy had a business, man. Yeah. And I'm going up there talking about puppies <laughs> afterwards. Hey, you guys ever... <sighs> Ever lose your keys? <laughs> <laughs> and you're searching. You're like this guy's talking yeah. about getting a blowjob while you're taking a shit. Yeah, it's he was just like, but he had that following of people that would just come to see just those songs. So they would hear the same songs over and over again. Right. They loved it. Right. Yes. That's another thing. Yes. Like Dice had that. Like Dice could always do the rhymes, and the audience wanted to hear those rhymes. What's in the bow, bitch? Oh. You don't have to write as much. It's no. great, right? You can, no. you know. But you're going to get bored. Like, you know, like, is that, you ever see that Kinnison song about the Beach Boys? Uh, Kinnison bit. Kinnison had a bit about the Beach Boys. No. About, like, you know, imagine them 35 years later singing the song. <laughs> same fucking song. Like, not wanting yeah. to be there anymore. Yeah. That it's just not the same experience. That's tough. Yeah. Yeah, you want, you want to be able to do new stuff. The new stuff is scary, but it's fun. It's so exciting. It's I mean... Fun. Uh, I found like it's, I never really worked my act. Like when, when I started doing the show and, and and getting involved with that, my stand-up, the writing and all that, I would still go to like Vegas with Ray to do it on a weekend, but I wasn't working my stuff. I wasn't a comedian. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like you got to really, you know, and, and I felt that. You know, you're delivering the same act year after year, kind of changing here a little bit here and there, and then you're going out and, doing it and it was like it was bothering me so much i hated my act i couldn't stand doing it anymore and didn't have time to write that much so like a few years back i just stopped and said i love stand-up so much like i just want to start and really get into it and i tell you it's it's the how much great... time did you take off of it i wasn't really off it was just like i would keep it going but just doing shows no writing like i really right. wasn't writing for right. years just doing years. bits yeah yeah I mean, if if something funny hit me, I would write it down, but not not working it, well, not the, writing. It's so hard when you're doing a television show, you know. And when I was doing news radio, I I fell into a real like a spot over a, a period at least a year where I wasn't writing at all. I didn't do any new jokes. I had the same tired ass jokes. You were we, I remember jumping in your Supra, and. Uh, Heading to the comedy store, like you would go up a lot. You would still do things there, no? Yeah, but that maybe that was a different time. That was when I snapped oh, out of it. Okay. So there was a oh, period. So there was a there was a period when I first moved there in like '94, where um, we were working like 16 hours a day, and I was tired yeah. all the time. And I would just show up at the club and do my set, and then go. And I was just doing it because I was still a comic. Yeah. I was like, in my That's head. That's what I felt like I was doing. In my head, I was always like, they're going to realize I'm not an actor. I'm going to get fired. This is this is the last TV show I ever work. I almost got fired from the first show I ever got was on. Right. It was where I was the star of the show. Hardball? Yeah, I almost got fired from that. I remember that one. Because I was, I was getting in an argument with the producer. They, they hired some new producer, and he wrote these terrible lines. I was like, this is insane like this is so bad it's insane and they were gonna fire me you didn't stomach it man i was like this is great well the thing is the guys who wrote the original show were brilliant they wrote for married with children they wrote for the simpsons right and um jeff martin and kevin curran and when they had their show the pilot was their show like jim brewer was the mascot i remember that it was fun yeah mike star from goodfellas yes. was in it I mean, it was uh, Bruce Greenwood, the guy that went on to be the st in the Star Trek movies. And these guys have been in everything. He was in Hardball. I, I remember. Yeah. I go to your tapings, Dude, man. Gonna, it was so was much fun. Get, they were going to fire me. 
because I was like, this is terrible. I so, love so that. So they, they hired a new producer. The new producer came in and took over and turned it into like the sloppiest, most obvious, terrible s- sitcom. Like that prototypical sitcom sure. where you watch and you go, ugh. Right. You just got to get out of the room. The jokes are so goddamn obvious. Right. And they wanted to fire him, but it was between me and him. And so it, it literally got down to this thing where my, you know, they're calling my agent saying, this kid is ruining his career. Oh, that's hilarious. And I was like, oh, no, I'm ruining my career. So I always thought that eventually they were going to figure out <laughs> right. that I'm not built for this. This right. is not my thing. And so when I would show up on, on the set of uh, news radio, it was like, it's like at any moment in time, they're going to figure out that I'm not supposed to be here. But we were working. Not only because you didn't want it, though. I thought you were funny as hell in that stuff. Yeah, it was just, like. You insecure. just didn't like it. You didn't. You're insecure. Didn't have an, any experience about actors. Didn't know how to hang around with them. Um, I was so used to comics. So, see, right. So, so for, me, for me, it was like fighters and then comics. Right. So just crazy people. Yeah. I was just only around crazy people. So when I was around normal people or people that were like really sensitive, like really, really sensitive, <laughs> like sensitive on purpose. Yeah. Like where they're trying to that's, be offended by things. That's sitcom people, and you know when they get into that. Oh, it was exhausting. Oh, that's hilarious. It was exhausting, and you'd always hear about tyrants. You'd always hear about like the Brett Butlers and the people that would scream and throw coffee in the face of the writers. Like, news, did, but news radio was that bad? Like those guys were. Oh, there was none of that there. Right? That no, was cool. No, there was a party. The, the, the writers were great. It was a totally different kind of experience. Right. But what was my point? My point was that what was my point? You were saying that thought I was going to get fired. Yeah, you wasn't. Like it wasn't for you. Point. You thought they're going to find you out. Oh, so I, I had to just do stand up just to prove oh. that I was still a comic. Because I remember at one point in time, the producer of news radio said to me, "He was like, why are you still doing stand up? You're an actor now." I was like, "Oh no, no I'll never take that away." From you. I was like, "Oh no, yeah. I got to get out of here." I was like, yeah. "I was literally thinking like, they're oh, this is you. like a they're trap. Changing you, it's this right. is a trap." Yeah. And then. Um, I had uh, one really bad set one night in front of one of the producers and one of the writers. <laughs> I fucking ate shit. Really? I went up at the store like late at night at like 1 a.m. in the main room and just had a terrible set. Just bombed. And then I, I really got to work after that. Then I realized like, oh, I've been slacking off. Well, that's what I felt, man. I've been that's, slacking yeah. off because I've been working 16-hour days yeah. and I use it as an excuse to not write. And then from then on, like everything got way better. Like way better. My, my stand-up, I, I dialed it in much more. How do you write? How do you, do you are you the guy sitting down? Every, I mean, I sit down in front of a computer and I just write. I just, I don't write like this is exactly how I'm going to say it. I just like spill my thoughts out because I feel like it takes me a lot longer to write the words than it does for me to think about things. So the more time that I'm actually just writing the words, it's extra time thinking about the thing. Do you speak it like into a computer? Into Do you it. talk it? No, I, I just type. Really? Yeah, I type. And I just, whatever the subject is, I'll like, there's just one subject that I'm doing right now where I've written it written about the subject four times so i start a whole new microsoft word file four times and just re- completely revisit it just one more time let's, what, pro- what let's program are you way. using because i'm not just with that word too. i just use, use microsoft word? word and i go into uh there's um focus mode have you seen focus mode yeah, so you, I used it to blocks use everything else out right? yeah i used to use right room i'll still use right room i did scrivener i did, like yeah, I'll, i use scrivener yeah but i'll find too. one thing about it and then I'll go, I don't like this, that. It does it sets my bits up this way, or I can't do this, or I can't mm-hmm. transfer that. And then I'll spend the whole day looking up for apps, for the perfect app, the, <laughs> and, I'm not, and I'm not writing. Yeah, it's like, you're distracting yourself. Of course, of, of course. course. Yeah, I, that, yeah I, I try to avoid that. But Scrivener, what I do with Scrivener is I make each individual bit, once I have it kind of boiled down, then I put it in the columns. So uh, the way Scrivener set up, you know, whatever the subject is. I love Scrivener. The only thing it didn't do, it didn't transfer transfer to my phone, or or the other, you know, like when I'm at a gig, right. And I want to look it up quick. You have to go to like a Dropbox, or like that, you know. Right. And it was like it was annoying. Right. I go, I can't. I need it right away. Yeah, that's you know? where Notes on iPhone is the best. The best. Yeah. The problem with Notes, you ready for this? I got them yeah. all. Yeah. You can't categorize. You can't. It, it it either goes alphabetical. So if you have your bits, I like seeing my bits on the side mm-hmm. where I go. Oh, okay, I'm working on this, and be able to move them anywhere you want. You can't. Right. Because it'll fall into that. That kind of screws me up. 
That's true. That you can't keep it in order. That's the only thing about it. Then yeah. I'm off that one. Then I'm looking for five more hours. I'm looking for other apps. Right, because if you have a folder in your notes and then you open up that folder and edit any one of those things, any one of those subjects, it changes. it'll move to the top. Yes. Because that's the newest one now. Yeah. Yeah. That's Yeah, that's not dumb. That's that should be an option. Somebody should make a just for stand up for for one of those things. I I would love it. I would love Yeah, to... but most comics don't use them. Most comics just write things down. Like you ever see Mark Norman stack? No. <laughs> it's crazy. He's got a stack like a fucking like a phone book, like that thick of index cards and napkins that he keeps in his pocket. And he's so crazy. Like you try to read it, you like it's literally like an yeah. insane person. Yeah. You're like cuz his, his handwriting's illegible. Yeah. 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 And there's no order to them. There's just stacks. I mean, he might. How many? How many did he have in his pocket? One hundred fifty. Easy. Easy. Way more than that. Easy. Two hundred. Two hundred index cards. Where do you in his pocket? Start? You go. How do you go? Here's what I'm going to do tonight. Card one sixty seven to one. No, it's a. How it's, do you do it? It's a window into the madness yeah. that is the brilliance of his comedy. It's just all. Wah! I remember Richard Lewis would would uh, throw out. I mean, like there'd be a piano up there, and he threw out like a scroll of like it was like just. You know, legal pads of paper and thing, like crazy stuff all over. Set it all up, and it's like he was a little nuts. He was nuts with that. Yeah, that was also God part of his thing, right? There's Norman's. Look at Norman Stack. Look at that. Look at that. That's what? Norman's yeah, I can't believe you carry this around with you. Ninety percent. You're gonna that. get a bad back. Oh. I'm worried about his back. <laughs> <laughs> but you you can get a bad back from that. A lot of it's like, like sitting on a fat wallet. Exactly. Taxi cab drivers. If they have too much shit in their wallet, you'll 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 have a little bit of a lean. And you'll could, get a bulge in your back. I could never do it. I could never I don't even know what I need to have it organized. Yeah, it just Yeah, you were always a, an organized guy, like even back in the day. I have to be. I, I admire that. I think that's a very important thing that some comics feel like they don't have to do, and you don't have to do it. Some of the greats don't write anything down. Right. Don't get me wrong. But I feel like when I write, <clears throat> if I just physically write, there's jokes that I will get that I won't get if I don't physically write. And not a few of them, like a lot of them. Like some of my best bits ever came from sitting down and writing. Do you find if you write the bit out, physically write it out, that you will remember it better too? Or not? By hand. Yeah. yeah. If you write it by hand, you remember it better. That's proven. So if I do an arena, I got this from you, by the way. Because, I got this from you All because right. uh, I'm not doing it. Anymore. No, no, no. I need to. Do no, this, this is this right. is what I got from you because I didn't have a rider because I'm lazy. So when I would go do theaters, they would just use Kevin James rider. So when I would, because we're the same manager, it. yeah. So we're the same manager. I was like, "What's Shimmy eating?" Right. Like, oh, was, did you see that? Yeah, it was like all normal stuff and like whatever. Like maybe I added whiskey to it or right. whatever it was. But uh, one thing you had was index cards. Yeah, and sharpies. I was like, "Oh, that's a great idea." So every time I do an arena now, I set up index cards, and I will get there an hour early and write out all my bits, write out all like the 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 key points of the bits, all the things I want to talk about, and set that there. And then next bit, set that there. And so I have this coffee table, and I've got all these things that index. Why cards don't you do a prompter or something like that? You don't want to do a no, prompter? No, 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 I don't need that. I'm, you, I'm fine. Once I once I write it all out, I've been doing it every night. I know every night. It's like I just like to do that as an extra little detail, just an extra little, just just really dotting all your eyes and crossing all your teeth. Yeah. So I feel good when I get. I, there. I don't know if it's I'm losing my memory, you know, whatever. It is, but it's like I need a I need bullet points up there. It's it, let me get you some of this. Do you take any oh nootropics? I take nothing. And okay, this is what you're gonna get. I'm, I'm gonna give you this. Just take this one, and I'll get you some more. I'll send you some more. That's Alpha Brain. That's uh, on I'm its. Really that's feeling the it. black label Alpha Brain. That is the the top of the food chain. Alpha Brain, the strongest one. Am I gonna see unicorns? No, 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 no. It just it helps memory. Okay. It's really good for memory, and it's really good for uh, focus. It just it gives you like a little extra juice. Mentally now if you're a moron, you're not gonna notice it like I try uh, fucking shit bullshit snake oil Trust me as someone who makes a living using his brain There are certain things that you can take that but, are not bad for you that are just nutrients that enhance brain function You know what another one is creatine 
creatine. Creatine's okay. Yeah. It's okay to do that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get- Creatine's very safe. Creatine's one of the, one of the safest supplements. Um, it's also- uh, What does that do, though? It gives you, it's, well, it adds water to your body. Your, your body has more water, and that's one of the functions of it, and it's one of the reasons why it makes your muscles look bigger, it makes you stronger. It really does work. As a, like a, a fitness supplement, like, as a, like if you're training and lifting weights, creatine is one of the very best things you could take. Creatine, I would say beta alanine. That's another one. But I, gotta, I gotta give you this thing that Weidman gave me, these herbal pills, completely natural, he gave me, we were playing golf in, I forget where, Atlanta or whatever it was, with DC. Cormier was there. It was just the, the three of us went out, and I was, you know, uh, I get up in the morning, my back is killing me, my everything, my joints are cur- hurting. I, I I get to the course, you know, you're walking around hills up and down all day, you know, I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm going I'm to be so gone on this thing. And Wyben says, take a couple of these, you know, pills. You usually got these things that are completely herbal. And, you know, what is it? It's... Ashwagandha, like it's, oh, I don't know, Ashwagandha. but it's, okay. with the key with this stuff is, I said, well, why, did, you know, because he gave it to me and he says, just do me a favor, mark right now where you feel, how you feel, how you're joined. I go, I feel horrible. My knees are killing me, my ankles, everything. I feel everything. My back, you swing in a golf club. That's, it's brutal. So he goes, and just take three and tell me how you feel in uh, like, uh, you know, in, in a few hours or whatever it was. And I forgot about it. And around the ninth hole. But I swear, I'm, I'm, I'm around the turn. I'm, I'm, it's a couple hours later. I'm going. I feel amazing for some reason. Like all the joints, you know, like, uh, like the jujitsu finger thing when you get yeah. when you first come back, and it's like oh, that pain. I had all that joint pain, and 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 uh, it was gone. I was literally pummeling with DC. I'm like, come on, let's go, man. <laughs> I felt amazing. I go, I go. It's the pills. I go. This is insane. I go. Can you give me? And DC tried them too. And DC said, I haven't wrestled in a long time. He goes. He tried them. He goes. I love it. Like, I want to know. I know nothing. I, I, I go, I, I'm trying to figure out this is a placebo effect or what it was. He gave it to me again. Same thing. Felt amazing. So, Does Weidman have those on his Instagram? Can we find out what that stuff is? I'm, I want to, literally, I don't go into business, but I want to, I want in on this thing, really? whatever it is. Dude, I'm going to give you, I have some. Try three give me di- some. Yes, just try it. Just mark how you feel if you have okay. any pain. Because if you go, ah, I felt nothing. It, it might be the case. But these mm. things, it, I'm, I did it a few times, and they ran out of them. He couldn't get them, and then he got them again. Everybody has given to How long to before him. they make that illegal, whatever it I is. I know. <laughs> they just made BPC-157 illegal. I know. It's, it's the, I'm telling <laughs> you, I'm, I'm, I'm out of shape now. It is literally the only thing that gets me up, and I'm like, whoa, I could, I could work out. I could do it. Really? I took them. I, I, again. I want to know what's in there. Yeah, I'll, I'll find out from him. Um it's all natural stuff, but the thing about it is... Speed's natural, too, you know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's all coming from I the know, earth. I know. <laughs> Everything's these, natural. The, the key, what they said in, in these things, is like the guy throws out... like Because when you get, even if you get ashwagandha, the active ingredient in it will, you know, it, like once it's gone, people sell it anyway, and it's like dust. It's like crap in there. He doesn't use... He throws out like 70% of the stuff he said. Mm. And I was like, I don't know. I don't care what it is. I just want it. I want to give it to my family because I, I want to feel better. You know, I'm just an older guy. I feel, you know. Yeah. I'm, you got to help me with that work. And I'm telling you, I am literally right now, I feel like I am on the cusp of either, you know, being that athletic guy, you know, go back into where, you know, I get in shape like crazy or I'm the wearing cardigan sweaters and <laughs> literally, you know, grandpa. <laughs> All good. Well, just get a trainer. I can't. I, I'm doing a documentary right now. Yeah. And I started it in January. I'm assembling the best guys. Like, like Dolce is going to help me out with this thing. He's awesome. We already did one. We already did a documentary. I did it on, uh, it was called Cheat Day, where I thought you could work out like six days a week and just have one day to eat what you you, know, you, you want and just do it that way. And I had Dolce come in and and and, and be on be, be in it with me and and work me out and do it. And he kept going, you're not you're not going to be able to do this. And I go, why? Because he goes, your one day is going to destroy everything. And he said, and I remember this. He goes, you can't outwork a bad diet. And he was right. It was like I would crush it so hard. Like people don't know what I can eat. Like you know, <laughs> I'm you know what I'm saying. You know, like when people go, oh, I'm a foodie. You know, like it's like you have no idea how much I can crush food. And that one day would just destroy it for the rest. Yeah. The the food thing is you can't outrun a bad diet. You just can't. You can't. You can't. It's the best phrase. It's real. 
that's that's where it all comes from. It yeah. all comes from food, and we're all addicted to food. And it's the craziest thing if you're addicted to food because you have to eat it. It's not like heroin. Like that's if right. you're addicted to heroin, like, oh, I've got a heroin problem, but I'm going to take a little bit of heroin. Right. No, you're going to go full bore again. You're, you're going to be fucked. It's right. like It's one of the very few things where you're addicted to it, and you got to not be addicted to it anymore, but yet you still need to eat it. Well, what? That's crazy. Yeah. That's a crazy conundrum. And most people's minds can't really process that. That's right. And I, I can't, I just, I can't, because he, he'll, he die, he's given me the diets, Dolce, you know, just do this, mm-hmm. this, and this, and this. You know, it's formula. It's very simple. I mean, by the way, does every, who, who needs some, a, another grown man to tell you what to eat? You know by now. Right. You know, seriously, you know. And same thing with working out. You don't know. Move your body. Whatever yeah. it is, do, you, you know what to do. You may not know yeah. the intricate stuff of like split squats and this and that. Work this thing. In. But uh, general health, you, you know what. Yeah. I got to move my body more, eat better foods, less processed food. We, we know it. Yeah. But yet, man, I can't. That's what this documentary I'm doing about. It. It's like why I have access to the greatest guys. Why can't I still do it? It's like and part of it is. I need the Goggins, you know. Yeah, thing. you need a hype man. Y- you do. You need someone around you who's also doing it. Well, that's it. You know? It's community. I don't mm-hmm. have that. It's like when I'm with Dolce, if we're on a movie together or, or do something, he's got me in shape. He's right. giving me the meals and, you know, it makes right. it, when I'm my own captain, yeah. I'm <laughs> homeboy. I'm gone. I'm you, just gone. You know, one thing that you can try uh, that I guarantee will help you lose weight is the carnivore diet because if you do it, the one thing that you're going to not eat is any carbohydrates. You're only going to eat meat. And if you cut out all bread, all pasta, all sugar, all bullshit, I'm not saying this is a great diet. I'm not saying this is the way to live. I'm saying this is the best way for me to eat. I've done every other yeah. kind of diet. This one works the best for me. And it's the one that keeps me lean. Because right. when you are eating just protein, your body hits a satiety level. If you're just eating steak, just steak. Your body will hit a level and you go, this is all I need. And then you won't want to eat more. But if I'm in that same mind space right. and there's a steak there, but it's na- next to mashed potatoes right. with gravy, a, a bowl of pasta, right. ice cream, then I'm going to keep going. And I'm going to get another 7,000 calories. Yes. I'm going to keep going. But if I just eat the steak, then my body starts processing ketones. I start, instead of using carbohydrates, I'm only eating protein and fats. Your body goes into like a, a ketogenic state. You think better. It gives you an extra gear with thinking. The ketogenic thing is, I mean, that for me is, is worked. It's because Dolce will hate me for saying, like, like he's like, you know, when they say blueberry, you know, or, you know carbs, he's, he, he's like, carbs are fine for you, like the right carbs. There's nothing wrong with carbs. It's a fuel for your body. But what I'm saying is if you're trying to lose weight, one of the best ways to regulate your appetite is a carnivore diet because you don't overeat with it. But I think it's deeper than that for me. I think it's mental. I think it's like anything will work. I fasted that. You know, like I've done everything, you know, it it all works for a while. But why am I this size now? You know, I'm, you know, every time I'm like, you know, just recently I started stop comparing myself to other people and trying to like just say get better than yourself yes that literally that yeah. that concept for me works it's like when i'm in there because he'll give me workouts dolce to do too and i can't do i don't do them i can't do the reps four sets of 16 th- i get so bored by myself like i start doing my right. own stuff i'll do eclectic stuff great stuff on a treadmill all movement stuff like i love it just throwing punches doing things but i walk around and then I, there's no way to measure it though, because the next day I'm not doing that. I'm, yeah. you know, so it's like I'm the guy who walks up to the bag, hits the bag a couple times, then walks. Oh, look at this thing! I got. I have every piece of equipment in 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 my, in my gym. I do. If you if you saw my gym, you go the, the Rock live here. You know, it's like li- <laughs> literally. It's like they see me and they're like, "What are you doing?" It's like <laughs> I buy everything because I buy into it. I'm like, right, because it's a little this. piece of hope. Yeah, that's what it is. Right. Right, a treadmill is a little piece of It's hope. a hope, a new thing. It, like, I got the uh, Jacob's Ladder. I go, mm. oh, it's great. It's jujitsu. You're grabbing yes. the ring. This is great. It's functional. Yeah, it's collecting dust is what it's doing. <laughs> it really, I because I don't use it. So I need something. That's what this thing is. What can get me, because I am like most people, I'm telling you. You don't need a lot of stuff, but you need something to engage yourself every day. 
there's got to be a bridge between what the Goggins way and people who do nothing. Like, like yeah. you got to get that. Like you, I, I saw you were doing this with the other comedians, which I love. You know, it's like where you go. I just want them to walk, or just get yeah. them down there. Get that is so important, man. Because it's like if you can get into that groove, you do feel better. Like that's what blows my mind. I've gotten in shape a couple times, and I'm like, I don't need to eat any more crap. I don't. I love the yeah. working. I love the way I feel. And then it slides right back. What happens? Well, it's in, it's one of the things about you that makes you really funny. Is you're indulgent. You're just you're a wild dude who's like trying to stay buttoned up. It's like part of what's really funny right, about you, right? And that indulgence, it 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 goes into other things. And for you, it's food, right? You know, luckily it's not but, gambling or something like right, really crazy, right? You but know? I don't. I, I quit things too. Like 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 I feel like I have the same almost intensity that you have, but I'm not a finisher. Like I don't. You we, get really we, into we, things. Then we started jujitsu. Did, did we start at the same time? Yeah, basically the Be same time. Beverly yeah. Hills Jiu-Jitsu, right? Yeah. Like, you were the one who brought me down there. Yeah. I'm a blue belt. <laughs> and and barely, 30 years, it's like yeah. 30 years. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, because I start, stop, I don't right. finish, you know what I'm saying? And that's in my head, I'm like, ah, oh, if I would have done what Joe did, man, look where I could have been. And I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, why do, and then I start comparing, like, ah, oh, you can do it now, you do that. And I, if I... If I play that game, I'm done because I can never catch up to yeah. other people. Well, a lot of it's like learned behavior patterns. You just have you get stuck in, and if you're unlucky, you can get a bad behavior pattern of constantly quitting things. Right. But if you're lucky, you could. Look, I got very lucky that when I was 15, I got obsessed with martial arts. Right. Because that was the first thing I ever did in my life where I didn't think I was a loser anymore. I was like, I realized that if you work really hard at something and you're completely obsessed with something, it could transform your life. So my my life from the time I was 15 to the time I was 18, I was a different human. Mm -hmm. From 14, 15, I was insecure. I'd get bad social anxiety. We moved around a lot. Right. I'd get picked on a lot. And I went from that to being completely confident mm -hmm. like, being a, yeah. just a different human being i was fighting all the time it wasn't like to me the uh, the fear of like conflict was pretty g much gone because i was just engaging in conflict all over the country i was flying around my whole high school all my time so i got in my head that the way to feel better and to get life to improve is to just fucking dig in mm -hmm. and keep going and don't ever quit. Don't fucking quit. That's so great. But I got lucky that that's something that I fell into when I was 15. I often think about, you know, there was one day, dude, one day when I was coming home from a baseball game where I walked up the stairs. We were getting ready to ride the T, which is like the Boston mm -hmm. subway, subway system. And we were getting ready to ride the T, but the line after the, the baseball game was like really long. There were so many people that were on the T. So we, just for a goof, walked up the stairs to see this Taekwondo school. And as we were walking up the stairs, this guy, John Lee, who was a national champion at the time, is preparing for the World Cup. And he was like 28 years old. He was in his prime. And he was kicking this bag. And as I was going up the stairs, I was hearing whoomp, and then the sound of a chain, like sh ching, whoomp, sh ching. And I went up and watched this guy kick the bag, and I was like, it's "What like the tong, fuck tong is po that?" And yeah, kickboxing. He's <laughs> kicking the pole. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was, I was just, I was like, I want to learn how to do that. Right. And I was there the next day. I signed up. I, I had enough money to pay for the class. So I signed up, and I was there every day from then on. I was there every day. I mean, every day. I worked out every day of the week. I worked out Sunday. I worked out every day. I never took time off. I was there for hours every day. I just eat food, go there, and I'll be starving by the time I left, and then head home and go Man, back again. That's your blessed brother because you you have something that most people don't have. That they don't have that. Like you have everybody who has the intensity in the beginning. You know when they see something like I want to do this. I want to say yeah. I do. Like every I get all pumped up. I'm like this is it. This is all I want to do, and then it's like you don't want to suffer. You don't want to put the you know the work yeah. in. The, you know, that's the difference between we are. we both love jujitsu. Well, to love something you gotta you you gotta know it. You have yeah. to know it, right? You can't love something you don't know. Well, I love it, but you know what I don't love. Obviously, I don't love 
the mornings, getting the gi, cold gi on. You know, there's things about getting in with a, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, getting on the mats. They're sweaty. They've been there since like five, five yeah. o'clock in the morning. I got to travel to do it. Uh, it's going to hurt. These guys are coming after me. You know, it's like, you yeah. know, you, you're in there and it's, uh, I'm nervous and my, so I, I stop. I like, I, I, I get back into it. You know, I'll, I'll let it go for a while. You do. You go through that and you become, you know, you overcome those little things and it's like, that's how you grow. It's like, I get right up to the edge of it and then I'm like, ah, I just, so I don't love it as much as you. It's like, you have to, you have to, you commit, you have to suffer. You have yeah. to suffer. You know, the, the, that's the only way you're going to show your love for anything is you get, you got to suffer for it. There's got to be that. You've got to overcome that. Otherwise, you, you don't, you, you died, you know, you, you have two pe everybody has two people inside of them. Mm -hmm. Everybody has the person inside of them that wants to go to sleep. Right. The person inside of them that wants to quit. That guy's winning, by the way, <laughs> that's the guy who's you see before you yeah. right now. And the other guy that's like, no, this is what you need to do. Right. But the problem is with a lot of people, that other guy that's like, no, that's what you need to do. That person's really timid. And that person, they, they just, well, maybe it'd be better if we just went for a run. Like, shut the fuck right. up. I'm going to eat chips. Right. And that that timid version of you is what you need to cultivate into being, like, the boss. Right. That's the boss. So I have a boss. My boss is that voice. Yes. I let that vo voice win every time. I love it. That voice says, shut the fuck up and get in the cold water, pussy. That's, that's dying to yourself, yeah. man. That's literally saying... I'm not going to go yeah. where I'm comfortable. I'm going to, you know, I'd much rather do this. I'm sure you'd, you know, much rather do something than jump in a cold plunge every morning, you, know, yeah. you know, get a cup of coffee and go hang out and talk, you know, you do that. And that's something I need to do more and more. Like, like yeah. we all do. It's like, it's the only way you're going to embrace it and, and get better at things. I'm trying, literally with flying, like I used to, I, I drive everywhere these gigs and it was getting so much that I'm like, I'm afraid of flying, but I'm like. I gotta just die to myself. Just do this. Have faith. You're gonna be fine. Just do yeah. it. And each time you do it, you're like, "All right, we did it." Yeah. And you have a bad flight, and you're like, "I'm not been doing it again," you know. But it's like, you know, <laughs> it's you just gotta give the boss some strength. Yes. Yeah. And the, the boss, right. the boss has to win a bunch of battles. And when the boss wins a bunch of battles, then he wins them every day. Then eventually, the boss becomes a louder voice. And then you get get it to the point where the the boss gets to tell you what to do, and you don't deviate. And even though you have all those feelings, every time I lift the lid on the cold plunge, I'm like, let's not do this. Uh, every You're time. And, and, but the boss is like, shut the fuck up. The boss gets mad if those voices pop up. So like, I'll make you do an extra minute, bitch. Right. Get the fuck in there. I love it. And, you know, there's two pieces of advice I always give comics or, or just young men in general. Aspire to be the person you pretend to be when you're trying to get laid. <laughs> Yeah. Just be that person. Yeah. Instead of pretending to be that person, become that person. Right. Become a person that you would admire. You can do, it's possible to do. If you can pretend to be that person, you can actually be that person. Right. Aspire to be that person. I, and then the second one is live your life like a documentary crew is following you around. Live your life like as if you wanted the whole world to go, wow, that guy's really killing it. Like, I love the way that guy handles things. I love, and then you're not going to, you're gonna fail. You're gonna fuck up. You're gonna. Be, you're a human. Everyone's gonna fall into a like. God, what a loser I am. Right. Just go back with the same ethic. Get back into it with the same mindset. Live your life like a documentary crew is following you around everywhere. How would you want to be seen? Who would well, be that person? Actually, be that person. Right. Become that person. You can become that person. It's funny we're doing that now, and it's like yeah. I've, I've, we started in January, and I'm, I've. I don't know. I think I might have went up four pounds. I don't even know. Like, it's, <laughs> it's like, you know, because I've go down and then it's like, but you're right. You're right. And yeah. we want to, I'm going to show it all, you know, because that's what it is. It's the struggle. It's the process. Dude, you just need a hype, man. If we were neighbors. Oh, buddy. Uh, by the way, I love Austin. I'm coming here. I want, Come I would be here, here every day. Fucking move here. Move here. The club's always very available. You'll have fun. Great place to work out. Come here to my gym. We can work out together. I'm in. Oh, we got a beautiful gym here. Dude, I think I, I'm just going to rip together. my kids out of school. We're going. Let's just do it. <laughs> it's great here, man. It, it is really amazing. is great here. The people are so friendly. You got uh, the the way they treat like freedom here is a, like a religion. Freedom is a different thing in Texas. They they are not interested in controlling your you know like, what you buy and where you go and what you do on your land. You can own a zebra. It. 
They don't give a fuck. There's more wild tigers, or there's more tigers, actual tigers, in captivity, in private collections in Texas than there are of all of the wild of the world. That's insane. <laughs> well, you just sold just me. I need, people who have I tigers. need zebras and tigers. They have, I, I drove by a place the other day that had giraffes. People have giraffes. That's it's, incredible. You can have whatever the fuck you want. If it's your land, they just leave you alone. They're like, this they is your it. land. You do whatever you want, you know? And they love and and the the comedy here they love. It's oh, booming. It's I went fun. and I got my beard trimmed at a place just yesterday and they were talking about the mothership. Like they go, and it's great. This the it's a whole different vibe here and everybody's yeah. great. And I'm like, really? And he was like, Oh yeah. yeah. Well, this is the first time in our lives where a scene emerged. There was kind of a little bit of a scene here in Austin. There was a few clubs, a few comics, some good comics came out of Austin for sure. Mm -hmm. But there was no real scene where a bunch of assassins lived in town. Mm -hmm. And uh, now there's like Shane Gillis lives Gillis, here. Yeah. Duncan Trussell lives here. Tom Segura lives here. Christina Pazitsky lives here. Tony Hinchcliffe lives here. David Lucas lives here. It's like, holy shit, Brian Simpson lives here. Tim Dillon lives here. He's got a house. He's got multiple houses. He lives everywhere. but. There's so many killers here. It's just every night you go to that club and it's just packed with great comedy. You know what it is? I'm telling you, it's community. Yeah. I don't have that. Like like when I'm, I have it in, you know, little bursts when I'm with people on a, a movie set or whatever it is, but it's like, I don't have that in my everyday yeah. life. I need that. I think, I really think that's a big thing. I really, cause I need the hype man. I need, but I need, yeah. you know, to we be in that other. group where you just yeah. start doing it. I did one one uh, training camp with Weidman and those guys, you know, earlier on, and uh, with Aljo and and these guys, and you know, uh, I uh, just jumped in with them, and it's like I was with them for I don't know a few weeks, three weeks, you know, and then I had to go out, but it was like you developed this brotherhood. Yes. yes, it was so much yes. fun. It was you know going through everything, you're eating together, you're running yeah. sprints together, and I was like, whoa, this is really, really cool. Well, this is what, that's one of the great things about fight teams, especially like uh, Sarah Longo. It's like those guys are so tight. They're, They're all great. friends. Always. Such They're a tight group. They're all friends, group. and they got so many killers there, too. Oh, my Jesus gosh. Jesus Christ. Aljo, Marab, Marab Chris This Wyman. is the funniest thing ever. Marab's I came my first animal. day on the camp, whatever, and they were sparring in, in the octagon, and I had my headgear on, and everybody's pairing off with everybody, you know, just in Wyben goes, you know, and Longo setting it up, just you guys go with you guys, everybody, and switch it around, this and that. And I was like worried because I go, Chris, I don't want to go in with, you know, he's get in there, get in there, just mix it up. And I'm going, I, I'm, I'm not even a fighter, I'm, I can't do this, you know, whatever. I got in there, everybody else, Aljo knows me, you know, you know, these guys know me. Marab thinks I'm a fat old fighter, like he thinks he doesn't know any, I get the headgear on, he doesn't recognize me as an actor. And he starts going. He starts dancing around. I'm going. Whoa! I know right away. He doesn't. He doesn't know. I'm not. You know. I'm an outside guy. He thinks I'm a guy in the camp. And he just starts going crazy. And I go. Whoa! My God! <laughs> and I'm trying to throw punches. And this guy's moving around like crazy on me. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm looking for Weidman. And, and it was. It was amazing. He was the sweetest guy ever. But I got lit up by him in two seconds. I go. I, I take it off. I go. I'm an actor, man. That guy does not get tired. Nothing. He's wild to watch. Did he see him with Henry Cejudo? He's got Henry Cejudo picked up over his shoulders and he's talking and he walks him over towards Mark Zuckerberg. It's, a, <laughs> it's, it's Henry Cejudo. That's an Olympic gold medalist. And you're carrying him around like he's a kid on a schoolyard who fucked up. It's a different breed, man. Oh man, he's an animal. Marab is an animal. And he, the sweetest I'm guy. Once you know the you, best. Yeah, he was really the cool. best. I love that dude. And everybody loves him. Like yeah. the response he gets from the audience. Yeah. He people love him. His last speech was so ridiculous. Oh my god. He, when he wins, he just gets so fired up. Uh. He's amazing. They, they, they fucking love Marab, man. They love look at that. Wow. Look at him. That's Henry Cejudo, that dude. Is crazy. You have to understand how crazy it is that he's carrying around that guy on his back. Like with that with guy, a smile. Yeah. yeah, I mean, two division UFC champion. He won the flyweight medal or the the flyweight belt, and he won the bantamweight belt. And Marab is literally toying with him. He's smiling and carrying him. I mean, that's that is so wild to see. That was one of the most shocking things. I mean, I've seen a lot of shocking things of people getting knocked out. I've seen a lot of things, but to see someone treat Henry Cejudo like that, oh. carry him around like that, laughing with a smile on his face, was like, oh. Well, now I could say I sparred with that guy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but yeah, that camaraderie we we yeah. needed as comics. Like that's why we opened up the club. It's, we opened up the club because we realized that one of the functions that the comedy store had for all of us it was home base. Yeah, we had a home base, and it was a great old club with this amazing history, and we were proud to be a part of it. And so we'd all get together, and we were proud. We were comedy store comics. It was fun. You go out on the road, yeah. and you come back home, and yeah, you see we're back at the family. Store. Yeah, and some of the best shows that we would have all year would be like Tuesday night, Wednesday night shows at the store. We'd go there, and it was just so fun. And right. everybody's just so happy to be around each other, other comedians, and just have fun and talk about jokes and talk about stand-up. And then when we came out here, I was like, well, there's no home base. There's no home base. We did the Vulcan, but it's not set up good for a green room. I was like, we need a real home base. And then I started looking. I started looking right away. And uh, the first place I bought was a cult theater it was owned by a cult that fell apart and then uh we got this opportunity to get that place on 6th street and i was like all right this is it and then we just started building and it's better than i ever could have hoped it's it's a real community now like you go into that green room and there's like fucking 20 dudes in there just talking laughing having uh, fun i miss soders there and lewis is there it's like people are from the road guys from new york guys from la people are coming in and out of town every week it's fun, man. I miss that, man, because I I don't have I have it when Sandler goes on tour and he, he he'll bring me right. out and and I go with him and it's right. just so much fun. It's so much fun, man. It's yeah. you know that's what we're missing. You know, if you're the guy who just does the theaters and you know you're with your family all week and then you have your opening act and you go on the road, that's exactly. It's, like, I am. it's not the same experience. It's not. No. I've been that for years. That's the guy I am. Yeah. You know, and I, I miss it, man. I really do. Come to Texas, Jimmy. I know. Come on, buddy. I got you. You gotta. Once I take this, it's a good place to live. The alpha, alpha brain, brain man. It's gonna change everything. Well, I wanna take those Weidman pills. But do we find out what the fuck they are? I'm, no? gonna, I'm gonna bring them into you. I have some. Just okay. try them. Just, and, and be. I'm I, ready. Well, you're gonna be honest. I'm gonna try them right away. Okay. I can't wait to try them. In my mind, I've already tried it. <laughs> <laughs> it had me wrestling DC. That's ridiculous. Wrestling DC and playing golf. It was the fun. I go in to pummel him, just messing around while he's holding a golf club, and you just feel you're like, oh my gosh, he's a bear. Oh my gosh, yeah, DC's a bear, <laughs> Div two division champion, man. You get you almost like you're playing yeah. with him, but you get scared. Over it was like I was with with Boss mm -hmm. when you you introduced me. Yeah. To Boss. you got me to Boss. When I met Boss, I remember I first had it was just the King of Queens started and. Uh, I was like, we could have this guy come and train us. This guy that we used to watch, you know. Yeah. What was it on? Uh, Pancrase. Pancrase. Yeah. And he had the high boots and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And then I was like, whoa, man, we can get this guy to to the you know to our dressing room, and we, we could work out with him. We I had a little space on the, on the set where you know we would train, and I brought him in that first day, and he couldn't even speak English. It was me and Rock, you know, uh, and I think my brother was there, and. Uh, they were, I'm talking to him and trying to keep the conversation going, you know, like that. And he's just sitting here. He's like, he doesn't even know what's going on, really, just <laughs> looking at me. And then those guys left the room, and I felt like I was in the room with, like, a leopard. You know, like, where yeah. you go, where your feet, as long as you're feeding it conversation stuff, it's okay. keeps eating it, and yeah. then it looks at you again. He was just looking at me, and I ran out of conversation. <laughs> I ran out of conversation. I'm like, all right, so... uh and he's just looking at me, and I'm like, this is a different human yeah. in front of me, you know. Especially go, back then. Oh, gosh, things could go bad. Yeah, ba Boss was a scary dude. Dude. In his, in his fighting days. He was the first guy that the UFC hired um, that I got excited about. Right. Because uh, he was a guy that I, re I knew who he was, because I had seen him fight in Pancrase, and he was one of the very first high-level strikers that made it into MMA, that Dutch kickboxing style. Or this here. Oh, right? yeah. In Pancrase, they'd, you'd have to hit with the palms. And Boss figured out that instead of bitch slapping people, you just spear them with your palm like a punch. Spear them, and he would say he would hit this part of the wrist. He yeah. would say, as opposed to even the palm. He did the he, bone. His bone. And he, he would just work the bag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he worked the bag with his palms to develop that power. And he had this crazy ability to pull his hand back. Ugh. Like his hand, like my hand doesn't really go much back further than that, but Boss's hand goes way back like this. Yeah. But he's got so, freaky long fingers. Crazy hands. Weird. Yeah. He's a weird. He's every, a real freak. Every injury I have to this day from turf toe and it came from him. You know, because <laughs> when I, he's the greatest guy in the world, by the way. Once we got to know each other. And, oh, he's awesome. Uh, he's one of my best friends. And he's, he's uh, we threw mats in my garage in Sino, in, in I remember. And he would come over and train me. 
and you know we would start on our knees and stuff like that and i remember one time uh we would just start on our knees and we were locked up and i remember i out muscled him and i pulled him to the side and then two seconds later he reversed me you know i was like whoa but i got him right there it was pretty sick you know and the next go we had it he pushed he goes you don't have it like he he rolled me back and i heard a pop and i thought it was my knee but it was uh, my toe my big toe oh no turf Dude, toe I, for still here still really yeah yeah never got rid of it so is it these tendon? pills help these pills help that. <laughs> these I'm pills serious. are everything. These, I'm telling yeah, these you. These pills should be the back of a wagon. Dude, I'm- This is for I, everything. I, I got to find a Diarrhea, way Diarrhea, gonorrhea. I just want to make sure. you Because you, nobody's, you're going to be like, dude, they do nothing. I which I, I love that. I bet they do something. Okay. I guarantee if you're having that kind of an experience with them, they do something. I, I just ch- wish I knew what they were. It's, I'll, so I'll, does I'll, the I'll audience. Well, I'll, I'll find it out for you. I don't want to do it now when we don't have it. Why don't you go grab them? Go grab them and bring them in here. I want to know what they are. Otherwise, we'll be in How are you going to know? You look at it and know what they are? Yeah. Well, is it just the pill by themselves? It's, it's a pill by themselves. Oh, there's no bottle? No, it's no, no. It's sketchy. No, no, no. It's not sketchy. This shit just not sketchy. It's, I promise you it's not sketchy. <laughs> I, no, no, no. Because it was a com- I'm telling you. We will figure it out. Okay. L- l- just you, you're going to love this stuff. Uh, yeah. And I don't then, know about all this. No, I think you will. <laughs> You and I will sit down with this stuff with Y Man, and we'll we'll gonna. I'm telling you, we're gonna save the world with this stuff. <laughs> it's an if an old man is telling you this, I am. You know, yeah. I'm telling you, it's the one thing. It's like Dude, we're both old now. Isn't that wild? No. Remember you, we were kids? Never thought you were gonna be an old man. Never. Never. How am I gonna be an old man? I How's remember, that possible? I'm yeah. a young guy. I'm always a young. Still I'm a young, young guy. guy. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly it. Also, you never got beaten down by life. Right, because right? you have a great job. Right. It's like if you if you have a job that sucks, you can get beaten down by life. Oh yeah. But if you have a job like we have, we enjoy our job. We it's do. like a thing. It is what we do for work, but it's also what we enjoy. Right. And it is work, but it's fun. Uh, it, it's great. Uh, there's nothing. You know, so the, the, stress is, is the stress is the stress in work is different. Yeah. But it's, they say you're only as happy as your least happy kid, right? I mean, that's oh, a, that's true. That's yeah. true. So it's like that's when you got that too. going on, mm-hmm. it always bounces that out mm-hmm. where you're like, man, the greatest life here ever. And then it's like, oh my gosh, I got to deal with this. You know? Yeah. And you know, it, it's not easy for kids. No. Like, especially today with social media <sighs> and the, just the weirdness of the world. And I mean, if you're a fucking kid today, you're a 15 year old kid and you're in high school and you see what, what the president is, you're like, what? Right. That's the guy running the world. Like, uh, 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 what is happening? Yeah. Is, how crazy is this? And then you, you've just gone through COVID, so everyone's confused. Like, what happened? It's a very Why was I locked time. up for two years? Like, yeah. what happened? And now here you are, you're about to make it out there in the world, and you're on social media all the time. Right. Like, it's a tough ride for kids today. Yeah. It is a very, very, very tough ride with new challenges that uh, we never had to experience. Dude, I, I, my oldest daughter is on the spectrum, and, you know, so we, we started seeing... Uh, you know, this anxiety and this disconnection, and it was, she developed, you know, uh, these tics, you know, I mean, like, really bad, where she started, like, hitting herself, you know, like, oh, couldn't, no. uncontrollable. She's a big, strong girl, you know. Uh, she was about, I think, 16, 15 at the time. And, you know, I remember, I mean, it was so scary for me that I had to lay on her at night and hold her down. And I, you know, I'm pretty sure she was hitting so hard and she's apologizing. She's like, I'm sorry that, you know, like I'm doing, and I'm like, what are you kidding? It was just, it broke my heart. So we brought her to the hospital. We went to the hospital, find out what, we didn't even know what this was. And, uh, the, you know, we, we where it was coming from. Uh, so they they got her to calm down, and, and uh, she was still ticking and stuff. And I talked to the neurologist. Is that what it is? I guess, I don't know, the yeah. doctor, you know. And I go, what is this? What can we do? And, and, and he said, he basically said, ah, she's developed these ticks. It's like, you know, this is something you're just going to have to learn to deal with. For, you know, you're going to have a child like this, and you have to prepare yourself that you and your wife are going to have to, you know, deal with this for the rest of your life this way. And I was like, there's got to be a different way. He's like, there's no way of really, we don't know, you know. And I just, I went, oh, man, it, it crushed me. So it was like me and my wife were like, what do we do? And my wife read this book. She was just doing all this crazy research. And she found this book, Disconnected Kids. And it was by Dr. Robert Melillo. So, you know, I, I, I got involved with him. I called him. And he literally took my daughter. He goes, I know what this is. He goes, it's okay. Uh, he, he says, uh, I can work with her. And we were just out of, like, we were lost. We didn't know what to do. I mean, I mean, I mean, violent, you know, it was like, oof. Um, so we took it to, to this doctor and 
within two weeks, no drugs, anything, two weeks, ticks were gone. And he said, they're going to still be there. They'll, they're going to come up every once in a while. But he fixed her, man. And I'm like, whoa. Uh, it wow. blew my mind, man. It's like, so I, I was like, I just want to give other parents hope. And, 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 and I, I knew another guy who had a daughter who's severely autistic. And, uh, you know, she was nonverbal and, you know, you know, violent too. And he said, he, he, he goes, I will, and he worked with them and, and she's getting so much better. And, and now in speaking and, uh, it, it's an amazing thing this guy does. He's How great. How's he doing it? What is he doing? I, I, I don't know at all. You know, he's, he, he works with the, the brainwaves and, and, um, again, not a doctor, but there's no, you know, medication in there. Uh, involved, which I, was very important because that's what they were recommending at the hospital. Right. Just put her on some medication. I'm like, and turn her into a zombie. Exactly. Yeah. I go. I can't do that. And she's so much better now. She still has the ticks every once in a while, you know. But she's great. She's connected. He gets her connected. He does all these like brain things, and he works with the, you know, and how it all ties into the the the, the motor, you know, whatever that is. The, it's so fascinating. It's it it, it is. And uh, he's another guy who's like, I, I really. <laughs> Uh, is this it? I've been told from, via your assistant this is what it is. Okay. There's no name for it, apparently. No okay. name for it? Yeah. So what do you mean there's no it. name? What do you mean there's no name? Okay, so it has Ashwagandha, Shav, Shat, Shatavari? Shatavari. Shatavari. Kavach seed, Fung, Fenu Greek seed, uh, Papali, Guaducci. Shajalit, oh, Shalajit, Shalajit. I've heard of that stuff before. I've heard of Shalajit, uh, Gokshura, and Santi. Oh boy. Well, but that's a mouthful, isn't it? I think this. It's not that the ingredients are that unique. I think it's the fact that the way they do it is. I don't know that he I says he doesn't use that. anything that's been like he, he throws out. A majority of it, which is that's why it's hard right. to come by, and it's like active ingredients for everything. You use they could sell you all the stuff, but if you don't get it from the right place, right? You know, it's it's just not gonna do anything. Whatever it is, I give it to you. you try. Really? Okay, <clears throat> I'm interested. I've never tried ashwagandha. Here's something that has the same ingredient. I'm not saying this is it. This just has the Influ same ingredients. Six fifty herbal supplement. Just has Pro the same ingredients. Healthy skeletal muscular response. Um, maintain healthy skeletal, skeletal muscular system. Okay. Interesting. Give it Send a shot. Send me that. Send I'll me send that, you. Jamie. That has the same ingredients? I, I mean, I literally copied and pasted and Googled. Mm. They're showing the same thing, same dosage. That looked know. like a but bullshit. It, again, it could be low like res said, try. image company. This could That's be right. The, uh, try shitty version try it. it. Okay. The, I know nothing. I'm going to try it. Thank you. I'm excited. And I'm excited to try this. You give it to everybody? I need this. <laughs> Anybody who, like, I just, for me, I want it for me. Yeah. And I know I, I'm not going to, you know, if it does, if it does, I, I sense the be it. Like, I'm not, if it's not working, it's not Actually, working. Actually, here you go. It's on What's Dolce's up? website. If it, if oh, it works for Dolce me. Oh, Dolce has it. Yes. Okay. That might be it. It must be it. It must be it. Yeah. If it's on his website, that's it. Infla 650. Okay. That's um, <clears throat> but, uh. Yeah, it's it was it, it, it works. Herbs work. There's a lot of them that work. Yeah, some of them are really good. It's that's what's interesting about pharmaceutical drugs is the vast majority of them are sourced uh, originally from plants. A lot of them from the Amazon. They've come up with a bunch of different pharmaceutical drugs just from based on compounds they found in the Amazon. <sighs> yeah, I don't even know. I just. Yeah. I didn't, I know nothing about this stuff. So when you started doing this documentary, what was the purpose? To find out the the process, because it's like I've, I've, I'm going to do a movie right now. Like every time I'm, I try to get in shape, it's always like I always have to get in shape. It's almost like, you know, a fighter who fights and then gets so out of shape again. Right. It's like, well, that's it. I mean, I shot a movie two years ago where I play an exorcist priest. Like, like And I wanted it to be re like it was really crazy, hard, like legit yeah. story. So I wanted to be, look a little different, be, you know. Uh, write in the part and just have a different character. So I got down to two thirty. I, I really worked hard, you know, like th that's low for me. And uh, shot it and thought we were done with it. And I got to pick up a couple scenes. I'm two eighty. No, dude, I'm gonna have to look like 
either right in that this priest got stung by a bee and it just <laughs> swelled up to, or or I got to get in shape for it. So I got to get in shape for it. I got to get back down to that again. How so much I, time did you have? I have as much as I, I you know, I will shoot it when I'm ready, but it's like, okay. it's waiting there to do a couple scenes 50 where- 50 pounds. How long does it take to you for you to lose 50 pounds? I can pounds? lose it really quick. I could fast and lose it. Seriously. I can lose it in, I could, I could lose it quick. Like how many weeks for 50? I could do it in a month. What? <laughs> That Dude, sounds so less, insane. Less than a month. I could do really? it. Really? Yeah. Fifty pounds. Um, I, that's I, amazing. I can do it fast. Fasting, just not you know. But that's you nothing. Must feel like shit though. No. Right? No. No. When I fast, I didn't. You know. How many days have you fasted in a row? You don't. You don't want to know. How many days? Forty-one and a half. <gasps> what? Forty-one and a half. You went forty-one days with no food. Water. And and a little salt in the water, like a little electrolytes, and I lost. Wow. Yeah. See, when I lock on, I can do something. Oh, I know that. But but, but that's a crazy lock on. Forty one days. Well, that was how much did I you was lose? Fasting for it was mental. It was like I I, I felt so bad for my daughter. I said, I'm going to do this for you. It was something that I could do, you know, and apply it to. And it was like so emotionally tied into me. And I started fasting, and I go, I didn't I didn't say I'm going to do forty days. I just said I'm going to do whatever I can. I'm going to start fasting right now. And I was praying for her. Like, I mean, I was worried. And I did like four or five days and I was getting through it, but I was like, I was wanting to get off it then. I was like, well, I got to start to eat because I'm really hungry. And I went and I, 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 I talked to my daughter. I go, how are you feeling? She goes, I've been feeling good. She goes, have you been fasting for me? And I go, yeah. And she goes, thank you so much. And I literally went, Okay, I gotta keep going. <laughs> I'm, I couldn't stop then. Right. So I just kept going day at a, a day at a time, you know, and just do it. But it's amazing how your body. You don't need it. You don't need food. As long as you have fat on you like that. Yeah. Like for me, I lost, I think, like 60 pounds. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah, there's that guy that was in the 1960s, right, Jamie? That one dude. Um, he fasted for 360-something yeah. days. He was really days. big, right? Yeah. Yeah, you All can do it. All he did is just take uh, IV vitamins. Just yeah. water and vitamins. I didn't even take vitamins. Like, you don't need anything, you know. Wow. And I felt. You took no vitamins. Nothing. Wow. But, you know, it was, it, it cleansed everything yeah. out of me. Like, I'm not saying it's the way to go for everybody. You know, like, it, I, I don't I don't know. Again, not a There's doctor. definitely some health benefits to fasting. Yeah. Especially short-term fasting. Well, they. But if you're big and you can do it, why not? That's it. It's like, yeah. well, how are you going to survive? Well, your you body your, eats fat. That's it. Yeah. That's what it was doing. It was surviving. And you probably had good energy. I, I was pretty good for, you know, uh, a, a while. And then you'd have these dips. And, you know, you'd, you'd feel like, wow, I feel miserable. I'm gonna, I'm off. I'm done. And right. then you fight through it. And you're like, the next day you wake up, you're like, I'm okay again. You know, it's like, keep going. Just keep right. going. Your body just yeah. says, all right, this is what we're dealing with. We're eating fat. I literally wrapped up the 41 and a half days at You're Gonna Crack Up. I went to Pizza University, which is a university to learn how to make pizzas, and I didn't even eat. I forgot I had booked it, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I go, I'm not going to kill it while I'm there. It was a three-day course where you get, like, a little diploma. I wanted to know how to make the dough and everything like that. Right. And uh, I went, oh, no, this falls within my diet. I just wanted to make it past 40 days. And uh, I went down there, and I did the whole thing, and I never ate a bite. Wow. Yeah, so it was, it was crazy. But then you blow back up to this. You know, it's like it's so it's like that's what the documentary is about. The documentary right. is about the process and finding something where you can help people with their health with, you know, it is what you were talking about. It's just get up and do something. Walk. Do it a little bit more each day is the key. You know, it's like when you don't even notice it's happening and all of a sudden yeah. you're this active. And a, a it's great. A big part of the key is having other people to do it with. That's one of the Community. great things about, like you were saying, training with Weidman and those guys. Yeah. It's like you're you're in a group of, where everybody else is working hard too, and it's contagious. Right. It's you get caught up in the momentum, and it's great, and everybody comes out of there feeling better, and you all went through something together. Yes. Yeah. That's it. That helps. It's very hard to do it by yourself. It, it's very hard. It not to do only it by helps. Yourself. It's like we need it. I think we're mm -hmm. we're built for that. We're made for that community. You yep. know. Yep. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. When you don't have it. It's it's hard. Yeah, it's not a good life if you don't have it. It's just not. You don't want to be by yourself, right? You know, like that's what well, you always hear about those, uh, like Howard Hughes type characters. That by themselves, are scared of germs and they're yeah, fucking yeah, hiding yeah, yeah. from everybody. Oh, your world gets smaller yeah. and smaller and smaller. Yeah, the bigger you get, the world gets yeah. smaller, and it's not good. Not good for you. No. Yeah, you could lose your marbles. 
to come to Texas, Jimmy. I'm coming. <laughs> I think I'm coming. I think you should My come. My wife's hearing this. She's going to hear this for the first time, but like, I think this is it. Yeah, It's a great place to live. I, uh, I look here in Florida and, <clears throat> you know. Yeah. Know. This is a great place to live. It's fantastic. I, again, I've never spent time here in Austin. This was the first, I was here for a few days writing, and um, I felt immediately at home. Like the moment I moved here, I was like, this is where I was supposed to be. Like it made sense. It made sense. It's like, of course. Texas. I thought you'd never leave LA too. I'm so yeah. glad you did. That was so cool. Well, I've been wanting to leave oh, for a while. You know, I tried Colorado you moved for out. a little bit. You but, moved out even from LA mm -hmm. further out in the stick, right? In the hills. Yeah, and, I was out in the hills. Yeah. I was always trying to be. Look, I when I bought my first house, I bought my first house out in the hills on like four acres. Right. Because I was like, I don't want to be around people. Right. I want quiet. I want animals. I want I want to look out my window and see a hawk fly by. Right. That's what I want to see. Yeah. That's what I like. You got that here. Yeah. But that's what I like. I, I don't like... I don't want to be overwhelmed by people. I don't think that's healthy for you. Mm -hmm. I don't, and with me, L.A. just got sketchy during COVID. It mm -hmm. just got the George Floyd riots. I was like, this is sketchy. I was watching a bunch of looting. I saw, <clears throat> saw these kids break into a clothes store. I was like, God damn it. This is sketchy. These cops can't do anything. They're they're overwhelmed. And then there's all this defund the police shit going mm -hmm. on. And everywhere I would go, I would go like, You'd see tents, and I was like, "This is a society that's fallen apart." And if you don't get out now, you're gonna get stuck in something unrecognizable. This is not what you signed up for. When when I lived in L.A. in the '90s, L.A. was great. Mm -hmm. It was great. It's kind of a lot of traffic, but other than mm -hmm. that, it was cool. Great place to live. All these comedians and artists, and fun. Sunny out all the time. Yay! We're in the right spot. But after COVID. After the George Floyd riots, I was like, uh-uh, I'm getting the fuck out of here. And then it's just the lockdowns and all the ridiculousness mm -hmm. and the hypocrisy and mm -hmm. just realizing that you have to pay attention to how fucking stupid the mayor is. Right. I never paid attention to the mayor. I didn't right. give a fuck who the mayor right. was. And then when COVID comes along, I'm like, oh, that guy's a real problem. Like, these people can become real problems. Mm -hmm. They can tell you you have to close your family business. You've had a business Horrible. for 30 years yep. and this fucking dipshit who shouldn't be managing a fucking Taco Bell right. is managing the entire city's e economy. Like, oh my God. And then they went after him too, which is even great. Like Black Lives Matter was protesting in front of his house like 30 days in a row. I'm like, God. <laughs> that's what you get, bitch. Yeah. That's what you get. <laughs> it just turns on itself. Yeah. Evil just, and then you, you brought it here and you planted these seeds and look yeah. what's growing, man. It's just so amazing. Luckily, a lot of other comics decided to move out here. That was the big one. Ron White was the king. He was always here. Ron White was here before he knew. COVID. He knew. Yeah. Ron White, I remember calling Ron White up. I go, why are you living in Austin? He goes, man, he goes, I'll still come to the comedy store, but I fucking love it. He goes, I love Texas. I love being here. I love living in Austin. It's a good city. And I was like, damn, it sounds like a good fucking city. Mm -hmm. And so when the pandemic came around and we were looking for places to live, we had some friends that were coming to look in Austin. I was like, let's look in Austin. And we came and we saw this house on the lake. I was like, let's go. My buddy, I have my buddy, uh, Scott Voss. He lived in uh, New York, like most of his life, in the city. And then he all, just abruptly moved to New Brunfels, you mm. know, New Brunfels. And he's always like a bow hunter and all this stuff. And he, he loved that stuff. That's for bosses. Bosses, yeah. they're, they're great friends. Yeah, Boss, and Boss lives buddy out Scott. here too now. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I know the whole thing. Yeah, he's, uh, they're amazing. And uh, he loves it. I'm always like, how is it? You know, like, are you, you know, missing New York? And he's like, not a stitch. You know, it's like. You can always visit New York. Yeah. I love New York. I do I too. love to go back and visit. I love to visit and eat. Yeah. I'm well, like, I'm on the island, so it's like, yeah. it's not in the craziness. Right. But it's, it's it, yeah, it's. it's The, the di island is a different state. Yes, it really is. It's a different of, state. 100%. It really is. Yep. It's a different state. It's not New York City. No. 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 No, no. I'm on, you know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's very got, right wing. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. It's much more families. Mm-hmm. Yeah, much more normal. Which is what I need, you know. Mm -hmm. I, you know, but here, well, Texas. I used to love working on the island. That was my favorite place to work. Governors, yes. Fucking Chuckles. Do you remember Chuckles? Chuckles? Yes. yes. <laughs> is that Mineola? Was that Mineola? It was in Mineola. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Eastside was great. That was a sad day when Eastside died. Closed. 
And then they they opened <sighs> another one, Richie, and uh, it just got away from him, and it was just uh, not a great. You know, he uh, took on a, a massive like store, like a, a massive warehouse, and started rebuilding it, and just got you know in over his head with stuff, and the you know the the, the boom was slowing down a little bit, of, you know, yeah. and it just got tough. Yeah, L- Long Island has always been a good place for comedy. Oh, the best. There's always real good comics coming out of Long Island. There's always like a, a Long Island attitude. Mm-hmm. Like you get guys who come into the city from Long Island. I was always like afraid a, of that. That was another move. Like, oh my God, <laughs> making that move to the city. People are like, you're going to go to the city? I'm like, I'm not going to the city yet. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. <sighs> I was so scared the first time I performed in the city. Oh, I was so the scared. The cellar. Where'd you go? Boston Comedy Club? No, or? Catch a Rising Star. Yes, me too. Louis Ferranda. Yes. Yes. I was so terrified. Wow. I thought I was going to bomb. I was so nervous. I'd never been more nervous for a show in my life. Because all the greats were, went yeah. through there, you know? I remember I watched a video that was online of Richard Pryor. <sighs> I, I guess back then I must have watched a tape, because this is we're talking about like the early 90s. Mm-hmm. It must have been a tape, but I watched a VHS tape of uh, Richard Pryor on stage at Catch. And I was like, oh, my God. I'm going to yeah. perform in the same place. And I knew Richard Belzer had performed there. Right. I knew... It was just a legendary club. Robert I couldn't believe Klein. I was. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't believe guys. I was there. Yeah. I couldn't believe I was allowed to be on the stage. <laughs> Me too, man. Yeah, but when it went okay, it went good. You know, I was like, okay. And then the next show I did the city, I was like loose. I was like, this is just a crowd. These are just people. That's it. And then I just got loose. But the 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 the, the allure of the city was always like, you can't trick them. Mm-hmm. They're going to be the smart people. Like you can trick all those losers that come to see you at a bar in you know the middle of Massachusetts, but if you're gonna go to New York fucking city, you better have your act together, mm-hmm. you know. And yeah, your act has to be tight. Stand up New York, the comic strip, mm-hmm. the comic strip. Remember Eddie Murphy yeah, was there. Yeah, that was I'm a like, tough oh one. Oh my gosh, Eddie was here. Yeah, you know, and you see that Chris Rock and these guys. And I'm like, whoa. Yeah. Well, the the cl- the clubs in New York, there were so many of them. Boston Comedy Club. Yeah. Dangerfield. Dangerfield. I played. How, I played great. in front of probably three people, yeah. right? Yeah. One o'clock in the morning yep. at yep. Dangerfields. Yeah. I was there once at Dangerfields, and my spot was at 9.30, and I got there at 9 o'clock, and everyone was by the bar. I'm like, what's going on? They're like, there's no crowd. And while we were there, two people showed up. And remember Bobby? Oh, he put the show on? Yeah, he yeah, was crazy, he goes, Bobby. Welcome to Dangerfields. <laughs> yes. And he just brought him yes. You started the show. Down, and yes. then the show started. Yes. And we, we all did stand up for two people. Oh, I love it. They were like held hostage. How could they leave? Ah, we're gonna get out of here. This sucks. Like what? There's five more guys coming. There was something about back then that I, I mean, I miss so much. That I guess it's the community again. But that whole drive to, to you know, yeah. the newness of mm-hmm. being in these clubs. The you know, the comedy cellar. You know. Also, we didn't know if we were gonna make it. That's it. You know, you back then you were like, am I gonna be a real professional or is this just bullshit? Should I think about getting a job? Job. Right. You know, I quit my last job way early. Did you? Yeah, I was working at a place called Granger in the uh, in the warehouse, just pulling orders. It was like an industrial equipment company, and uh, I hated it. It was so hot, and I'm I'm like miserable, and I'm doing like one, like I'm doing an improv class, and like a couple dates I have here and there, and I was like, I think I'm gonna turn into comedy. I think I can make a living of this stuff, and it's like <laughs> pulled out way too. Living at home, my folks, and it's like. I might have pulled that a little early, but you know. But you're, that's you're, the way you do it, though. Yeah, you'll find jobs and things to do to make money while you're struggling. Right. But it's if you if you have a net, you'll fall. Right. Yeah. You're right. That's you gotta you have to you have to be one hundred percent all in because in the be- and in the beginning, like in the first days when you and I knew each other, we were just like kind of opening acts. Right. Which is like, you're not really making much money. Right. Maybe you could headline some little scrub room in the middle right. of nowhere. Right. Make a couple hundred bucks that night, drive to Connecticut. You know, so it was, uh, it was precarious. Like, who knows what's going to happen? I could fall, but we all knew guys who fell apart. There was guys who were Majority. like headliners, yes. who were big comics, and they just yes. fell apart. They fell apart. They couldn't, they couldn't handle it for right. whatever reason. It's weird, fear of success or just like whatever it is. They just they didn't know how to go to the next level. Or I think for or, them, it's a lot of that they didn't have community. I think back then, it, even more so than it's a problem now. It was way more of a problem back then because everybody was in competition with each other. Right. Nobody looked at other people like other people that are just like me that are out there doing great, and so that's awesome for everybody. Right. Back then, like if you and I were friends and there was a Tonight Show host spot available, 
and they were going to talk to you and they were going to talk to me. We couldn't be friends anymore. Right. Then, like, the people would, like, turn on each other. They would they would backstab each other, like the famous David Letterman and Jay Leno things. Right. Where Leno's, like, hiding in the closet. closet yeah. Listening to... Yeah. It was like, they were in competition with each other. Did everything. you have a group of guys in Boston around you, like, when you first started, or no, was it just you? Me and Fitzsimmons were always tight. Right. And we started out literally a week apart from each other in open mics. Right. And so, and then Chris McGuire, I was always tight with Chris, and there was a few guys from that era that I, I, I stayed friends with. That we did a lot of road gigs together, and right. we were tight, and that was real fun. I, I Mostly so... Fitzsimmons, because Fitzsimmons was a, he was a good buddy, and we we did a lot of gigs together when we were starting out. We'd drive to Rhode Island for free, yeah, and just do open mics. I in drove Rhode to Island. Allen, Pennsylvania, for I mean like twenty bucks or something. <laughs> I remember like I go, this is cost me more than tolls. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, but I'm went. Yeah, you know? but that's the only way to do it. You know, you have to you have to put in those hours and that time, and you have to be. F- and if you're with someone else who's also doing it, it makes it way easier. So yeah, it made it easier for sure to be friends with Fitzsimmons because we were both doing the same thing at the same time. Yeah, but there wasn't a group like we had in L.A. In L.A., that was had, yeah. that was the different that was a different thing. That was a real brother and sisterhood. Like it was like everybody was like so tight, and everybody was so supportive because it coincided with the internet. When the internet came along, then instead of everybody being in competition with each other for a sitcom or a, a you know a, a TV show, now everybody was on each other's podcasts. Right. So now it was only beneficial. Yes. It was like if I Build could go do up. Schultz's podcast, that right. would make my Netflix special get more people to watch right. it. If I could go do this, it would do that. If I could do all these different things, it would actually promote stuff and it would make it bigger and better. And then it was like everybody's podcast grew because they were on other people's podcasts and no one suffered. No right. one saw, there was no negative, like of all the people that I ever had on my podcast that went on to do podcasts and tour and do arenas, it only helped me. It only helps. It never hurt. Sure. It only helps. It helps them, it helps me, it helps the audience, it helps like everybody. helping them is insane. I mean, like, look at the careers you've built from this. You know, I, and, and didn't, that, I just exposed people to talented people that well, already I, existed, and that uh, benefits me. You know? Absolutely, 100%. But it's like, you, you give them this platform, and it, it does, it, it grows, because then they're able to do it and bring up other people, and, you know... And it's, then other people are seeing that, and they're they're applying that in their own lives. Yeah, too. it definitely wasn't the case. But the back in the day, I felt like I had my brother Gary and Rock, and you know mm-hmm. uh, Adam Ferrara and yep. R- Richie Minovic. Like we had this tight group that we would look out for each other. Those guys, yeah. you know, we would try to do that. But other than that, it was backstab. It was like they were just trying to get in the yeah. way and don't tell this guy about this audition. It's like, ah, yeah. you know, I hated that. I hated that. Well, that's why I loved hanging out with you and mm-hmm. Ferrara, and you know, it's like you could find good dudes, and you all hang together and all enjoy each other's success, and and do shows together too. That was the most fun thing when you the and best, I got to man, do shows boy, together. Wasn't that the best? <laughs> it was the best. Oh, I loved it we so much. We had so many fun gigs. It was such a good time, and it, just to be on the sideline because oh. you're one of those guys that if if I'm laughing hard in the room, you go crazy. Oh, you get me nuts. You build me up. You are. You are the the hype man because you'd. Find Fire me up and we'd Well, I, I always knew you at your best. Right. I always knew who you were. Like if we were just at a bar and you just started going off about yeah, something and yeah, we're crying, yeah, laughing. Yeah. You had this ability to get fucking furious about something in the most hilarious way. Yeah. And I was like, you gotta bring Shimmy I know, out. I know. You gotta bring Shimmy out on that stage. You, you, you were like one of the few guys. I'm telling you, you and Sandler are, 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 are guys that believed in me more than I believe in me. You know what I'm saying? It really. I mean, it's, well, sometimes it's amazing. Well, sometimes your special quality is to be comfortable around your friends, and then that, that's where you show your f- full potential. Right. And then it's up to your friends to say, you got to just carry that with you on the stage because that's you. At your, like the bit that you do about pulling up to the curb and the, the, the lock cancels oh, out yes. with the girl Going grabs crazy. the hand. That, yes. <laughs> that is, that's, a, that's a full shimmy bit. Yes. I mean, that's, you got me. You yeah. built it. Yeah. You were like, you got to go nuts with that. And I was like more and more and adding it <laughs> and going. I literally jumped in the audience yeah. in, during because you got me. Like that yeah. was it. When we were up at uh, Montreal, you like, you got to go shimmy. And I like went nuts. You I jumped literally jumped. I jumped on some guy in the crowd. I've never done that before, ever. I freaked. This was like, yeah. you know, but that got me my deal. That, yeah. you know, that's literally being that nuts, you know. Yeah, it was awesome. It, it was, was awesome. Nuts. But that's that's you at your best. But sometimes, like, that's, you know, sometimes people need a coach. 
Right. You sometimes you need you know you, you need a hype man. You, well, my friends do that all the time. We do it for each other. They do it to me. They'll say like Tony last night. We we're going over a bit. He's like, I really think that when you're saying this, maybe say that first. Right. And I was like, damn, maybe you're right. Right. And every now and then, someone will see things with fresh eyes, and they got to pull you aside and go, I think you should do it this way. And you're like, ooh, I like it. Let me try it. And I'll try it the next show, and like, oh my god, you're right. Yes. That's it. Yes. Ah, and you think hug. of that. That's the. Be- it's a comfort level. It's a comfort mm-hmm. level when you're when you're comfortable with somebody, and you you know you you, you get past that. You just you open up and you try to and you know each other. That's exactly mm-hmm. what it was. Like I said, we would go out and do these, and, and that would be it. it. You would give me these things and get me all hyped up, and it, it changed who I was. Yeah. It changed what I again that comedian that with the you know standing up there in the middle with the mic stand and like you were just that guy to me. You were that guy that was just like you didn't care, and I was like ah, I want to be that. You know, I remember one time we were at one of the improvs, the Brea Improv, or yeah. one, one of those improvs. And uh, one of the fucking guys who's working the sound booth goes, what did you do to him? <laughs> <laughs> I go, that's him. That's, that's him. That's the I real know. shimmy. That's when he when it comes out. Because you were just going nuts. You are just going nuts. You're like, oh, dude, he goes so crazy when you're here. Oh. Like, that's, that's him. That's yeah, him. I need you in my life that way. Like, I need you to do that with everything. I'm telling you, that's what I miss when I'm on my side. Because, again, my own captain, I go off the rails. I'll start overthinking things. Yeah. And it's like, you that, know. You know, that happens with fighters, too. I'm sure. Yeah, fighters decide that they're the boss, and then they don't have a guy like that. It, happened with Tyson. Like Tyson was with Customato. Customato died, and now he doesn't have a boss anymore. Right. He doesn't have the the alpha. He doesn't have this this uh, this 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 wise person who's overseeing all of it. Going no 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 not this this and right. this is why this is why you have to approach it this way. Like yeah, this is why like. Sometimes people need a coach. You need you need a you need someone around you who knows exactly what's going on. I don't care if it's you if you're like I need it in a, like if I'm writing a movie or writing doing whatever it is, I need people to to say, "Hey, you yeah. got to see it you you cuz you're in your own head. Right. Everything has that same flavor. Like I'm always like, "Ah, we're writing the same type of movies and this and that because I'm controlling everything." And sometimes right. I got to relinquish that control and say, yep. "Let someone else say, you know, believe me, trust them. Just yep. go with it, you know?" Yep. And I struggle with that cuz I'm like, "No, no, no, no." You know. Right, right, and right. that's that's the key to it. And I could see that in the fight game. It must be like you know, where I take over and I know better and I got to switch right. camps and do all this stuff. or Especially whatever. if you're the champ, right. right? If you're beating everybody and you think, like, I'm fucking everybody up because I'm the best. And then your manager is, like, looking at Clover Lang and right. Rocky. Right. He's like, no, this fucking guy is doing the real thing. Right. Like, you, you're, you better watch out. Yeah, you're you don't see trouble. this coming. You don't yes. see this coming. Yeah. It's, it's, and you have to have that guy around you. Otherwise, you'll be delusional and you wind up, like, with a flashlight in your face. That's going, right. Happened? That's right. And, you know, they're wheeling you out in a stretcher. That's uh, th- that's the thing with success. Like, And also the part of success is to get successful, you have to get really uncomfortable. And once you get to a certain level of comfort, you're, you're like, I don't want to be uncomfortable anymore. Right. I did all that, in the, but that's over. I'm done. But the only way you keep getting better is to be uncomfortable. That's it. That's it, the ice bath every yeah, morning. That's literally to, going. You why do you you don't have to do this anymore? Yeah. You know, it's like, but why? So you got to build up the boss in your head. Like I made my own coach because I realized there's not going to be enough coaches around me. Like I had coaches when I was doing martial arts. I mean, there was a giant factor for me that I, I went to that Jay Hun Kim Taekwondo mm-hmm. Institute in Boston, which was like one of the best best gyms in the country. Right. I just got just dumb luck happened to be there at the right time, but. Once I realized that you're not going to have a coach everywhere, like you got to be able to coach yourself. Like I write out my training routines all myself. I write them out, so I know what I have to do, and I, and I just do it. I found an old journal, like when I was literally doing. I did karate for four. Uh, I don't know how many years it was. When I got to like a brown belt, you know, when I was in, in high school and stuff like that, or, or a little just as. I guess it was ending then. Maybe it was just going into college. I was by a brown belt by then. But I never felt that we had a guy named Al Wilson in our school who was a boxer. And I was learning all the karate stuff. And I was really good in karate. You know, I was, I'd had these, you know, the, the, the moves and stuff like that. And the katas down like crazy, crank them out, like rip them, you know, like really right. powerful. And this guy was just different. You know, it was boxing. You know, like I didn't have that. So I never had that confidence even then. Like in, as a brown belt, I was like, I, I need to know something. Else. Like I got to learn. Yeah. Something. And, 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 and it, it really, you know. Boxing's an eye opener. Oh, my gosh. And wrestling. You yeah. know, it's like all these things. That's yep. what I'm saying. As far as that stuff, it's like. 
Those I, are two big eye openers, especially if you think that you know how to fight because you know how to do karate, and then someone like, you box with somebody, yeah. and you're like, oh, this yeah. is a totally different thing. I got to learn this now. Learn it like I learned everything else. I remember when you took me to uh, when we went to Beverly Hills Jiu Jitsu. I remember my the one probably the first class. A guy grabbed me and held me just against his chest, and my face was in his chest in his gi, and I couldn't breathe. I didn't yeah. know what to do, so I reached up and I was like grabbing his throat, which you're not. <laughs> But I was panicking. Yeah. I mean, you know, and he was like, "Whoa, you know, like, whatever." And I was like, "Whoa, I didn't know." And I just played it off, but I was gone. <laughs> I was gone. He was like, "I was going to tap from a chest." Yeah, hold. people do that in in black belt tournaments. I, I do it all the time. It's a smother smother choke. Yeah, I can't. I can't do that. Like, people smother tap people. Like big guys would get on top of people and tuck them in between their pecs. Oh and my smother god! Them. Yeah, I'm out. I, yeah. I feel like I'm drowning. I'm yeah, done. You are kind of drowning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's scary. It is scary, but if you can learn defense of that, yeah. then you're always going to be safe. That's the thing. It's like if you can just figure out how to defend yourself in those positions just to stay alive, and it's the worst feeling in the world to be trapped under someone for five minutes where they're trying to kill you. But if you can, de if you can develop enough confidence that you're safe no matter what, that's what Hicks and Gracie always said. Right. He goes, I am always safe. He always, he goes, always yeah. defense. My defense is perfect. Mm -hmm. I am always safe. So he never worried about being tapped because he was always putting himself in these terrible positions. He would have black belts start on his back with a fully locked in rear naked choke. That's how you have them start. That's yeah. Then you're not afraid of anything. You're, you've of anything. been there before. You got you've, defense. Yes. Yeah. You got your defense. I so. if I if I applied what I think about all day long to actually practicing it. Yeah. I don't, but I think about it all the time. Like, you gotta build that coach up in your brain. Dude, you gotta have I your would own. literally look up things and I go, I would watch everything and be like, I saw uh, Eddie Bravo once say, or I heard that he said, I won't even teach anybody until you can do the, the butterfly, you can get it to the, you know, to your knees to the, the, the mat. And then no, he like, said you can't get a black belt. He, he oh, said, is that what it was? Yeah, you can't get a black belt until you get your knees to the mat. Oh, okay. I thought, like, I thought he was like, I thought he was like, oh, no, I took no, it that no. way, and I'm like, I started pushing, you know, and the, no. but then I faded. Like I don't. Do he it. gave up on that, by the way. Oh, did it? Yeah, he R gave up on that oh. because he realized you could be a black belt without putting your knees to the mat. Yeah, because I can't move. Like you know, it's just Eddie has a very specific style, and it's super effective, and it's very dangerous. Off, he's one of the most dangerous guys ever off his back. And so he developed this style based on flexibility and movement. And uh, I could always do that because I was very lucky that I- You've always done, been flexible. Because I did Taekwondo when I right. was really young and I always stretched. So I, I didn't have any problem adopting his techniques, but a lot of people did just because of the, the dexterity issues. I would, I would think like, because that was like the rubber guard and stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? And it was like, I was always a big guy. So I didn't know whether in my head I would go, I shouldn't train this way because it's not my style of fighting or whatever, or should I be a big guy that can do that? And I would go back and forth, go, right. ah, and, you know, some trainers would be like, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't do, do this. You know, don't waste your time doing that. You'll never do that. And I'm like, well, what if I'm, you know, nothing scarier than a heavyweight that can move around and be like that, yeah. you know. A and, heavyweight that can fight off his back is one of the most which, dangerous guys. I can't. I got it. That gotta. was always Noguera's, uh, like, big thing. Right. Because Minotaro, <laughs> back in the day when Minotaro was the pride champion, Noguera was a lethal black belt off his back. So these guys are so used to wrestling guys and taking them down. But you get taken down, you're in Noguera's guard. You're right. In, you're in, you're in trouble. Fabrizio Verdum, he tapped all the greats yeah. from his back. Yeah. Fabrizio Verdum, he, he tapped Fedor from his back. That's so I mean, come on, man. Fedor from his back. That was the, he was the first guy to beat Fedor. And everybody was like, holy yeah. Yeah. shit. And yeah. the way he did it with just pure jujitsu, he got him an armbar triangle combination. He's like, this is checkmate, motherfucker. Just slap that down. Like, and Boy, Fabrizio Verdun had the most wicked of all guards. He, he tapped all the greats. He tapped Cain Velasquez. He tapped Minotauro. He tapped Fedor. He tapped like some of the greatest of all time. That guy tapped. I Off get, his back! That's crazy. That's what I have to... I, I literally... I have to get back to it. I really got to get back to it because that fear of those positions that you, you just don't want to ever get mm -hmm. in. It's the suffocation. It's yeah. this and that. And even every time I start up again... I, I, I hate the warm ups. That warm ups, I'm like yep. dizzy. Like, you know, I'm doing these like crab walks and stuff like that. I'm like already out, like, you know. Yep. And, but it's like, I have a guy that uh, Weidman hooked me up with. You know, I was going to go to uh, Sarah because Sarah's out there. It's great jujitsu. Um, 
uh, but for some reason, Wyman goes, go to this guy. He's he's gr- He'll be great with you. His name is Derek Manji. He does monster jujitsu, out, but it was like an hour away from me. But he's the greatest guy, and he comes to my house, and he trains me and stuff, and he's just a beast. But it's like... I've got to get past uh, literally out of my head and go get in these positions. But I, when I train with him, he's so big. Like I, I get on his back or whatever it is, and he just gets up. It's like an apartment building just coming up. Like <laughs> I can't even hold, you know, I don't. Right. And it's so frustrating to me. And he's flexible and big, and he can move around. And it's like, I this is where I don't finish. I quit. I'm like, ah, I get frustrated, and well, I don't, you know. Honestly, the thing about training with someone who's really good, the problem is you're never going to get good enough to tap them because they're always going to be ahead of you. You really should train with people that are okay. That's the best way to train. The best way to get really good at jiu-jitsu, I've always said, and Eddie Bravo used to always say this, is strangle blue belts. Really? Find people that can resist a little bit, but they're not really on your level, and right. just drill on them. Right. You drill on them. And that way, then when you get to brown belts and you get to black belts, you're 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 sharp, and you have all these reps of finishing the technique. Reps. All these reps of That's closing. That's the other thing. Closing the technique off. Do you recommend r- r- just drilling, drilling, drilling? 100%. Dr- drilling is almost more important than anything. Really? Yeah, because it solidifies the move in your head. When I got really good, <clears throat> the best I got at jiu-jitsu when I went from uh, blue belt to purple belt was when I was training with Eddie, and we were drilling all the time. It, we were drilling multiple times a week. Right. So we'd get together, and we would, for an hour and a half, we would just drill. And it sucks. You don't want to. You want to roll. Rolling is fun. Sparring is right, fun. Right. You know, it's like you're playing a video game. You're right. But if you can just force yourself to do the work and do a lot of drilling, your your technique will get really sharp. All the best guys drill. They drill all the time. They do they, they do either do live drills where you all start from a certain position or they'll do drills where they'll go over a specific path. Like Eddie was big on going over paths. Like, I want you to do this. You pass the guard, he goes to block, you set this up, and then you counter with that. And then we would drill that and very forth. position over. So then when that would come up in training, when you would go to pass and someone would block and then you would take their back, it's like, oh, it just it's all synced it's, in right. to your nervous system. So when you're – and that enables you to, when you're in a position – yeah. To think two or three moves ahead. and just You're, to be- you're not going to get that if you're training with some big black belt. You're not going to get that. You're never going to get to the point where you could do that to him. It's oh, not he, he's happen. great. It's not, it's not him. No, I'm, it's I'm not him. It's, it's me. That but it's, getting, but even he'll, you, he'll, he brings even guys. if he lets you do it, yeah. it's not the same. Right. you got to be able to do it to someone who's not no. letting you do it and someone who you don't know. You know. Well, that's the key. That's Once you start one. learning someone and you're mm-hmm. kind of... Yeah, you don't want to know them. Right. You want he, you want to be able to like f- solve a human puzzle. Right. Some person is pulling on your shit and he's kind of freaking Not out. Not only a that, bit. it's the fear of that. Yeah. Like I hate that. I don't like that. <laughs> you love it. I hate going to a class where I don't know. Every- yes. First of all, I hate the gi. I hate everything. I suffocate in that thing. That thing is Watch cement no hard. Gi. Go Nugi. I Because then I feel like you're not learning the techniques. And then but you are. You are. You, you are? definitely are. Yeah, 100. percent At this, I have a black belt know. in gi and I have a black belt in no gi. I can do both of them. I've done both of them. But I trained I'm, both of them at the same time. But one of the things that I did from learning from Eddie was, because I was training so much no gi, but I was also training gi, I would go in and do the gi, but I wouldn't use it. I would let them use it on me. But I was just concentrating on overhooks and underhooks, and I was concentrating on all the same grips that I would use so that I would never be deficient. Because if you get used to grabbing collars and sleeves and you get used to adjusting people with butterfly sweeps and stuff like that based on grips, the problem with that is all those grips go away when everyone's slippery and it's just bare chest. So you have, I, so I was just all about clinching and I was all about a tight game. Right. It was all about learning what Eddie's moves were. And Eddie's right. moves were all overhooks and underhooks. It was all wrestling yeah. based. And it was all become because of Jean-Jacques Machado. So <laughs> our instructor, Jean-Jacques, his left hand, he only has I a know. thumb. Yeah. He trained me a couple days in, uh, in Encino. When I was there. He came amazing. to my house. He was such a great He's guy. He's the best. He really He's is. He's the best. It's when I look at these videos of, you know, uh, where they take the gi belt or whatever it is and underneath and wrap it around this thing. It's like, I, I always go, yeah. it's not that it can't work or whatever, but I always look for things that are applicable. Like, yeah. like uh, you know, I want to be able to, you know, yeah. and it's like, that to me, I, I, I can't do that. Yeah. I can't, you know, so, but I always heard that for you to get better at no gi, you want to train gi because it's like taking a bat and, you know, swinging with the donut on it. <laughs> nah. 
that doesn't make any sense. Okay. No. No, you want to train. It's like to get really good at racquetball, you need to play tennis. It right. doesn't make any sense. Well, I got you, four massive geese. If you want to use them for something, <laughs> you could throw them over your couch or whatever you feel like doing because I'm happy to get rid of them. Listen, there's nothing wrong with the gi. The gi is still great. And what the gi does do is it forces you to be very technical because you can't yeah. muscle out of things. It's, you can't just pull out of stuff because you're trapped. So you have to learn how to use the proper defense and also never let you get to get yourself into a position where someone's completely cinched up on you like you like if someone has like uh, like there's certain chokes like a clock choke mm -hmm. like if they reach into your collar and they grab a hold of your collar like this and then they get this arm mm -hmm. wrapped around here you're in a bad spot because right. then I'm gonna spin oh gosh I'm gonna go oh yeah and it's like, like a tourniquet this. right and it's terrible it's, it's a tourniquet oh it's death it's death it's such a horrible choke to get stuck in so you just gotta in those situations the gi can be very, like if you're in a, a street fight with a guy who's got a, a winter jacket on. Some guy's got a leather jacket on, and he grabs you, and you grab a hold of that collar, and you pull him to the side, and you fish that arm underneath his shoulder. That's a dead man. Right. Like, he didn't even know he's dead. Yeah. He's a dead man. Yeah. Like, if you get a hold of someone's leather jacket, right. and then you get your arm under there, right. and you get this like this, you're like, oh, son. You got him. You're going for a right. gator roll. Right, 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 right. Uh, I love that. Yeah. So this, like a judo player who fighting someone with a winter jacket, you're fucked. That guy's going to hit you with the world. He's going to spike you on your fucking Oy. head on the concrete. And you're not even going to be able to stop it. You're not going to be able to do a goddamn thing. So it's good to learn the gi because most people are wearing clothes. Yeah, I'm just going to go out shirtless from I now mean, on. Like you, just you can not even wear anything. You could easily choke someone with a, with a hoodie. Right. you get on top of someone with a hoodie... And you get all up in here and you fucking... This is different level. This yeah. is not what I'm... Literally, I need to. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to start. I really do. I got I to gotta do something because it's like it's... There's nothing wrong with the gi. The gi's great. The gi's great. I, I My still problem love the gi. It grip also strength, slows it down. When you it yeah. does slow the game down yeah. for older guys, too. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing. That's why they keep saying, yeah. you don't want to go no gi because it's going to be, it, but it's like, it'll be a lot quicker. But I don't mind. I, I like that. As long as it's a yeah. guy in my level, it does slow the game down. But also, to me, I just feel suffocated. Like everybody's mm -hmm. always grabbing me and I'm yeah. like, I'm out. I'm like tapping like crazy. I'm like, I'm, you know. Um, and plus, my grip strength, I ripped, I first of all, tore this bicep when I was. Oh, Did you get it repaired? Or is it just like, like this Matt one Sarah? happened? This one happened uh, about five six years ago. I was uh, I hired a uh, a personal trainer, uh, and she came to my house. Like I didn't even know. She just it, it, she was like a, almost like the uh, CrossFit person, and she's like, "We're gonna work on strength." And I never deadlifted or did anything. And they started doing deadlifts, and she was like, "Just show, I didn't even literally know how to do it." She was like showing me, she, and she was getting so excited. She goes, "That's pretty good weight. Let's can we bump it up a little bit?" And it was like one thirty five, two twenty five, two seventy five, and then she goes, "Can we go a little bit more?" She put three fifteen on it, and then I go, and I got it, and she was like, "Can we go four oh five? Like whatever." She bumped up, and I'm going, and I'm starting to feel like a little tired, and, I'm like, <laughs> and I go, "I don't know, I don't know if we should do this. I don't know if this is getting me." But she was so happy. She's like, this is really good. It was like a personal. Be you know, right. And I go, I've never done it. I did 405, and I felt a little something. I got it. I just got it. And she was like, this is amazing. And then she said, can we go like 450? And oh, she put, no. yes. And I went, pop, right away. I, I got it up for a little bit, and I just went, Ooh. I felt, I go, oh my gosh. But it didn't, it was such a bad, it, 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 it didn't tear away from the bone. It just, there was like it looked like it was like chopped meat, and there was a hole, it ripped a hole in the middle of it. Oh, so it was weird. It was like he goes, the guy looked at it, and he goes, "We can't even do anything with it." So it's like you just it, have to heal. You just got to let it heal. Does and, it still have a hole? Like when you flex? Yeah. Well, it's, it's you can't see this one as much. You can see a little divot. You see a little divot here, but then uh, just recently I did a move with Joey Diaz. I did that movie. Uh, I did a movie with him, and there was a lot of fighting in it, and. Um, I'm fight training with the guys, and we're re rehearsing all the, the choreography and uh, going through the moves, and we did it, like, a lot. And it was the end of the time. They like He's like, do you want to run it one more time? And I was like, uh, all right. He was just run it slow just, just to get it because I was getting tired, and, and I had to go in and double leg the guy or whatever it was. And I went in to double leg him, and it was very slow. And he moved to the side, and he went this way, and it stretched my arm, and it went. Think I go and they go. Oh, that looked awesome, awesome guys. And I go, no, 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 no. I literally have it recorded. Uh, I go, something's wrong. I go, something's wrong. And this one, 
this one's bad. I, I, it's it's nasty. It's like it's a, it's the Matt Sarah one. It, it rolled up on me. Ooh. And it was I got it checked out, and they go, it's completely torn. And um, you know, the the guy was doing PT on me. Uh, 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 you know this guy Amato. He's awesome, Johnny Amato. He's awesome he guy to do PT, and he, he he was telling me he's like, well, the good thing about it is it's torn completely because it's not. You know, you're going to be able to do everything with it. And I had to go into the movie, so they go, do you want to get it fixed? You should get it fixed. And he's, you know, it was like one of those things where it's like, you don't lose, you don't gain that much strength. Believe it or not, the bicep doesn't do that much. The bicep itself. It's kind of like a turning a key, and it's like that's where it'll be affected a lot, which is, you know, that's actually not that so bad. did for you it. get it fixed or no? I didn't. I couldn't because I had to go into the movie and oh, shoot the movie. Wow. If I, because if you do that, you get it fixed, it's the rehab is like it's long, you know. Uh, so uh, I go, I can't do it. So they said, I go, can I get it done after the movie? And they go, you can't because it's a window of the muscle. Like if you don't attach it right away, it travels up. It won't take. Yeah. So I did it. I didn't do it. And, uh, it's bad. It, yeah. and, and it still hurts. It cramps every time. Like, I don't feel like I can do anything. I've mm. lost so much strength on this thing now. That's, you wish you'd gotten the surgery? I do. Yeah, I that do. That sucks. Yeah, um, I always wondered about Matt's arm. I look at he's that arm. strong as hell. Like, it doesn't yeah. affect him, though. He yeah. says, you know, I think he says it's, it's fine. Like, a bunch of guys care. get that one. That's a real common one. It's, a lot of, it's common with a lot of times when people throw a punch. Like, if the punch gets blocked, mm -hmm. the, the bicep will pop and curl up. I've seen that a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah, it's this is ugly and it's bad. Remember, Kyle Parisian had that with sure. the hamstring. Yeah. Oh my gosh, did he? Yeah, he had a hole in his hamstring. His hamstring just ripped apart and it shriveled up, and it always fucked with him like the rest of his career. Oh, it's in your head. Well, also his one leg just was not as strong. Right. So his one leg was like always compromised. He should have had a surgery on it like right from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, but guys try to rehab stuff. There's like that fine window, that small window between uh, fixing something and not being able to ever fix it. Like TJ Dillashaw went through that with his shoulders. He tried to just rehab his shoulders, and his shoulders wind up becoming chronic, and now they ruined his career. Right. Yeah, sh any kind of injury to a joint, I always say get, get the get surgery if you can. If, if it's that bad, get the surgery. But also, it depends on what it is. Like right. if it's a bicep, yeah, get the surgery. But there's certain things like mm, stem cells might be able to fix that better than surgery. So it's like knowing where to go and who to talk to and what doctors have actually gone through this before. But you can't do that now. It's too with late. What? With stem cell or anything no, like, with like this? With the bicep? No. Once yeah. it's shriveled up, it's shriveled up. Yeah. You have a very small window. I think a bicep, the window is just a couple of weeks. You, just, you, have yeah. to, you, get, a, yes. you get it repaired like really quickly. Uh, I should have yeah. done it because I really. Th that th sucks. It does. That's a bummer. It's, you know, slowing me down for sure. I tore my MCL getting on stage once. What? Yes, at Stubbs. It's Stubbs in, in Texas. I was I'm walking up to the stage. Stubbs is this uh, outdoor uh, amphitheater, and as you're turning the corner, it's these concrete stairs, but they're spaced differently. And so I was like... Check. I was turning my recorder on on my phone and, and walking up the stairs, being called up to the stage, and I misstepped and twisted my foot, and it popped my knee bad. Where when I went on stage, my leg was shaking like I was nervous. Like, you didn't stop. You I was did, in you agony. Did I was in agony. Yeah, I just did my set. Oh my god. Yeah, I just powered through it, but I was like, my leg is shaking so bad. It looks like I'm so nervous. Yeah. Like everyone can see this. Oh no. But it was just pain. I was. I should have addressed it. I should have said, I just blew my knee out. <laughs> I should have said that so what like a, that people know why my knee is shaking. Yeah. Because otherwise I was like, God, how do I stop my knee from shaking? Like and this guy's nervous. nervous. Yeah, it shook for like the first fuck 10 minutes at least. Did you sit down? Nope. Nope. Just You're nuts. Did my set. Yeah. It was still went great. The show, still, the show was fun, but then my knee was fucked up for a year after that. I had to get a bunch of stem cells. I got stem cells in it like three times before it finally got to the point where it doesn't bother me anymore. How is it now? It's great. Yeah, now it's great. Now I can kick the bag. No problems. Wow. Yeah, I did a lot of knee over toe stuff too. That that uh, uh, Ben Patrick. Yeah, program. that stuff. I yeah, that's great stuff. Mm -hmm. That's a, it's a big game changer. I've strengthened my legs quite a bit more since uh, I did that. Since I had that injury, the Nordic curls and you know the, the slant board squats, I got goblet that, squats. That sled too mm -hmm. on the wheels, whatever yeah, it's called, the the torque sled. It. Yes, it's that just the I shit. just I just push it light and then mm -hmm. just walk back with it slow, mm -hmm. you know, and just keep going digging in. Yeah, I feel it in my legs and it's it's great. The walking back is huge. 
that's such a, a crazy uh, way to strengthen your legs to pull a sled backwards. Such a good way to strengthen your knees. Right. Yeah, it just keeps everything strong and firm. Yeah. So it's like, and as long as you stay flexible as well, and and you're strong, like you have stability. You have range of motion, but you also have stability. That's that's giant. That's key. <sighs> I got it. I'm doing a, this movie now where it's me and uh, it's an action movie. I'm going into literally leaving tonight to uh, uh, Vancouver to, to to it's like a crazy action movie with and I wanted to get in shape for it and it didn't happen. So I'm like, I don't know. With, with uh, I'm next to this beast too, uh, Alan Richson. Oh, from that the guy for the Reacher. That yes. guy's huge. That guy's He's huge. Out. Oh my gosh! I was like, I got to train to get you know ready. For, and I'm like, nothing happened. And now I'm like, oh boy, we're going that into guy this thing. Is the perfect guy for that show because you know they did that movie with Tom Cruise, he, he, and it was like a, it, it, the character was never that small, right? Or no, in the book, the character was this monster. The, yeah. the character in the book was Alan Richmond. Yeah. Richson, he, he's a rich beast. Son. He's a Richson. Be- yeah, right. really good. Look yeah, at this look at dude. That. I mean, dude's ridiculous. He's amazing. He's a house. That guy's a house. Great dude too. Yeah, so. he seems like a really nice guy. Unbelievable. I've seen him in interviews. He seems like a really nice guy. But yeah. he's the perfect guy for that series. Yeah. That they just, you know, Tom Cruise is the blockbuster boy. So yeah. they're like, let's just do it with Tom Cruise. They're like, but he's five nine. Right. Like this is this guy's got to be a gorilla. He's got to be a fucking linebacker. He's a linebacker with a genius brain. He yeah. can kill people. This guy's this guy's a, yeah. He's perfect for it. He is. But yeah. uh. So, I'm so gonna you be, have to do an action movie with him. Yeah. Oh no. And just just start fasting. I just start <laughs> <laughs> how much time do you have before the camera rolls? <laughs> I just suck it out. I mean, it's it's crazy, man. I it's like fighting that age, but it's like you're right. You look at yeah. you're doing it, man. It's like such a difference mm-hmm. how you are with what you do and what you've implemented. You're, you're we're a different species, you and I. I'm telling you. It's well, I just like, stayed on it. Yeah. I just never let off the gas. Yeah. That's the key. Yep. But also being careful, like knowing like what's fucked up and what's not, and knowing not to try to work through injuries but to heal them and making sure that they don't happen anymore by increasing range of motion and strengthening things mm-hmm. and just making sure your your whole system is strong. Right. Like, I do a lot of like non sexy exercises like Turkish get ups and things like that. Things right. that strengthen the whole body, windmills. Yeah. Those are the things that I like. Because no one likes to do them, right. and those are the things I, I when I walk around the gym and you know do a couple of things. It's like that's where I have to change my mindset to go go into the places where it where does it hurt when you bend mm-hmm. where it you know the ankle strength foot right. you know all this stuff to get you know comfortable in that and it's like yeah. that's the stuff that's so important. Turkish get ups, I hate those. Everybody hates those. I don't like to do it. I don't you know. There's so, no like bench press is cool. You know, like you bang out ten reps, like yeah, we did it. Turkish get-ups, you never feel like you're done. It's always no, like, oh, exactly. Ugh, it's hard, and it, you're, everything's working. Your legs are working, your core is working. Do you do a specific working. sets, and, and mm-hmm. or do you are you more like on your own? Just do a like, do you go? I I just gonna work this area, and I'm gonna do as many as I just want to drill it. Or no, do you have like a, a set? I have sets. You yeah. do? Yeah, yeah. I'll do like um, you know, I do my warm up. My warm up after the cold plunge is always 100 push ups and 100 body weight squats. So that's the warm up. So that gets you going. That gets you warm after you've done the cold. So that now you're heated up again. And then I do. Wait my a second. 100 push ups and 100 body weight squats. That that's more than my week, right? <laughs> like like I even this is your warm up. <laughs> yeah, that's the warm up every day. Yeah, that's 15 minutes. So 15 minutes it takes to do 100 push ups and 100 body weight squats. I do those. And then I do swings. So uh, depending upon whether or not I'm feeling good or whether or not I need more warm up, I either go with 50 or 70 pounds. So if I go to 70 pounds, that means That's I'm ready to go. And so I do three sets of 10 swings with each arm with 70 pounds. Wow. And then I do uh, clean press, three sets of 10 with each arm with clean press. And then I do three sets of windmills with each arm. And then I do uh, three sets of renegade rows. You know, renegade rows where you're like doing a push up on the kettlebell. So you got the kettlebells, two on the ground, uh, same distance apart as your shoulders. 
and you do a push up, and then in the locked push up position, you do a row with one side, boom, mm -hmm. and then a row with the other side, boom, back down for a push up, back up, row with one side, boom. Oh so your gosh. core is totally engaged the entire time. You're in a plank the entire time, and the entire time you're either going down to do a push up. You lock up, and then you're st stabilizing yourself as you pull the one so kettlebell that's up. That's core. That's boom. Everything. Put that down. Yeah, boom. And you do that. You do that with seventy pounds, three sets of ten, on each side, and you get worn the fuck out. You know. So you're doing twenty reps every time I'm doing this. So I'm doing ten reps with each hand. So I'm doing that with seventy pounds, and so I do three sets of those. And then once I get done with that, then I usually either do the sled or I'll do something else. I'll do like rounds on the bag. I'll do like something else. And is that is that timed and all that stuff too, or is it no? no you just no. I like to give myself time in between sets because I want to be fully recovered before I get into the set again. I don't believe in. Uh, I I follow this Russian principle, this uh, power, this strong first principle, which is. You, the most important thing is how much weight are you pushing and for how many reps. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if those reps come over five minutes or they come over 20 minutes. And it's probably better if they come over 20 minutes than over five minutes because you have a lot of time. I'll, I'll take five, maybe even 10 minutes Rest. in between sets. Yeah. So I'm fully ready to go. And then when I'm doing the clean press with 70 pounds and I'm doing 10 reps each side, I'm no problem doing that. I'm not fatigued. Like I'm fatigued. It's hard, it's it's difficult, but it's not where I'm like at the point of failure ever. If I if my point of failure was ten reps, I would do five. Right, and then I would wait a long time, and then I do another five. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, so I'm getting so you never lot of reps. You're never getting to that point where you're pushing yourself to the point where you're can hurt yourself or never, never, love it. never. That's all I do. I don't lift anything heavier than seventy pounds. That's you don't the need heavy, to, right? Yeah, I mean, you don't need to. People think you do. I mean, it's one thing it if you're a football what you want player. To do. Exactly. Yeah. If you're a power athlete and you need to do cleans and squats and deadlifts, that's great. But I don't need to do that. I just keep my body strong. And then I do my endurance work. My endurance work is either sled pulling or it's uh, Tabatas on the air bike or it's rounds on the back. And wow. then I get in the sauna. And the saunas, that's, that's, that's so you go in there right when you're tired. And you just step in that 195 degrees. 195? Sit in there for 20 minutes. Yeah. What's your cold plunge at? 34 degrees. I would have a heart attack <laughs> it's fun. instantly. Uh, I would be gone. I, 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 I have mine ready. I have one. And it's 50. It was 52 <laughs> degrees. It was 52, which was, fr I was shaking, man. But I would yeah. like, I would, I would just go in there. I was in there for 15 minutes, though. I would do that. Yeah. You don't need to go that long. You don't need to, but you can do that if it's fifty. Is it? Yeah, you can. I mean, it's probably giving you the same result if you do fifteen minutes at uh, at fifty as you're doing three minutes at thirty four. That's it's probably crazy. giving you the same result or similar result. The whole idea is that you freak your body out and it produces cold shock proteins. And how does that um, compare to the, uh, the 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 chamber one where you get the air? Is it just like a uh, does that get you cold? You know the one where you yeah, just stand. They're both they're both brutal. They're both brutal. I think I've never done the that cold one. water is a different animal, though. It's It, it gets in your you, bones more, yeah, right? Yeah, you feel colder. The, like when you'd get out of that, uh, the the, uh, the cryotherapy machine, when you get out of there, and within a couple of minutes, you're like, whoo, you're okay. You get out of that cold water like for a fucking yeah, half yeah. an hour. You're like, Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah, yeah. But that was the way I would warm up. I would just go right into the bodyweight squats and the push-ups. So that was my way of heating my body back up after the cold. But don't your joints feel just frozen at that no, point? No, no, you're all right. You're all right. I mean, it's body weight, so it's not much weight. So you're just kind of pushing. Right. You know, you could easily do 20 push-ups. You just do the 20 push-ups, take a break, do the 20 body weight squats, take a break. <sighs> Heart rate drops back down, next set. 20 body weight squats, 20 push-ups, next set. Do it. Do it five times, you've got 100. And then by that time, I'm warm. And so then I'll do whatever the other workout is. Right. Maybe I'll jump rope. Maybe I'll, you know, it depends on what I'm doing that day. Right. But I always write it out. If you, you do. write it, yeah, because if you write it out, you don't give yourself any room for fuckery, because you know this is what you have to do. It's all written out. Like that's the boss. The boss gets in there and writes it all out before the the ego steps in, and they're like, 
let's go eat. I'm hungry. Once it's there, it's, it's like there. You get a better workout if you have some fruit first. Let's go have some fruit. You get a better, better workout if you eat. Yeah. I'll, I'll, you know what? I have a window between 3 and 4.30. I'll get a really good workout then. And then right now, I'll just go watch TV. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's everybody. Me. But you just got to have that boss in your brain right. has to be in control. You and and once you get it yeah. subdued like that mm-hmm. much, it becomes it's not that hard, right? You the just whole go, thing is momentum. The right. whole thing is doing is everybody that has ever had a good day. You have a good day where you really get your shit together. You start feeling good about yourself, mm-hmm. and you go. The key is just carry that forward and keep going, and don't let yourself fuck off. And if you do give yourself a, a day off, recognize that just like an alcoholic that starts drinking again, this could be a slippery slope. Well, so if you give yourself that day off, be real w- aware of what you're doing. I'm like, I self-sabotage. Like if I go, I'm such a, I'll start Monday again or I'll start tomorrow. That that hope of starting the next day, I have it so much. I remember like when I was training and uh, Weidman said this to me. He goes, when you, you know, you're training and you, you know, get a flat, you know, you don't get out and flick, fix the flat. You get out and pop the other three tires. Like, you literally do. And I do. It's like, yeah. once I go off, I go, ah, all right, I'm off. I'll start, you know, Monday. Jesus. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I crush it. Yeah. I, I do. Yeah. Oh, man, I would love to eat with you. You know that. You know, but I'm saying, like, yeah. but, but I, you're right. And, and you can eat and do it in, in the right way. And I'm sure you enjoy food. Yeah. And It's just you got to, the boss has to be fully in control before you get a day off. Yes. And it, it is almost like sobriety in that way. Like you just, you, you have to get so much momentum that you're fully confident that you could take a day off and just eat ice cream. And there's nothing wrong with that if you do have a hold of it. But even it ha- if that's, te- that's got to be tempered though. Like you can't, yes. like I noticed I can't, I can't do a day off where I'm just crushing myself. It's like, there's no coming back. The day, the next day you feel like shit. A hundred percent. Yeah. You know, but the thing is you have gone on schedule and gotten in shape before yes. you have done it so you know you can do it so it's maybe even more frustrating than someone who's never done it that's right because you have like dropped 60 pounds you have gotten in shape again and i remember when you were training mitts with della grate yes. i was watching you hit the pads like you fuck when you got in shape for here comes the boom you got in fucking shape and you you were training hard mm. and i was watching some of those sessions it's like so i know you can get to that spot right it's just like maintaining. I know. That's the thing is maintaining. And, and now as I go, it's like God takes a little thing away from me, the bicep pull now. It's yeah. like, and they go. Another new reason. It's a little, yeah, it's yep. like I got to fight it, man. And like, like I said, I'm teetering, mm-hmm. teetering between that. You know, I got to go back. I got to go back. And it's you're right, man. It's Yeah, I, you just got to decide. And one of the best ways to decide is to write things down. It's so easy to just keep a thought in your head and you don't really give it the, the, the what it deserves. You got to write things down occasionally. You have to really do. And I write down my workouts. I have a big whiteboard in my gym, too. Just put it up there. Write it up. Just write it down before you do it. And give yourself a realistic goal. Don't don't be nutty to the point where the next day you're going to be a dead man. Give yourself a realistic goal. Dolce has, he goes, get up, go for a walk. Mm -hmm. Just go for a walk for 40 minutes, you know, whatever. And it really what happens is when I start walking, I'll start moving around. I feel good. I go, you know, whatever. Blood and I start adding pumping. more, you know. Yes. And, and it's like, my goodness. Then mm-hmm. I start, you know, wanting to throw, I'll get the egg weights and I'll just mm-hmm. start throwing with those and just, yeah. I love it. I really, yeah. you know, it, it's it's something that is really addictive in a, in a good way that like you can, you know, once you start doing it and it's a little bit, it's the pressure of you don't have to do so much. Just do this. Yep. And then, yeah, if your your pressure is, okay, now you have to lift weights for an hour and then go to a 90-minute yoga class right, right, and right, run right. a marathon, like, fuck that. Right. You, it needs to be very realistic. Like, you know, we're going to start off today, you're going to do 20 push-ups, 20 bodyweight squats, 10 cleans, 10 presses, uh, you know, a couple of chin-ups, and then you're done. That's a wrap. That's a di- That's yeah. a 20 minutes. Yeah. 20 minutes, and never be exhausted. And then take, you know, the next day you're going to do something different but equally light. And you do that for a couple of weeks. And if you write it all out, it shouldn't take you more than even 20 minutes to work out. And you can get through 20 minutes. Just write it all out. Make sure you follow it. And, you know, one of the best things for me is I I, I have a TV in the gym and I'll put fights on. So I'll be watching fights. Get inspired inspired watching fights. And then you you go through your routine and you're good. And as long as you write it out. And if you write it out and you know, I know I wrote this down on paper, I have to do what this says. You're committing to yeah, it. Yeah, you You're have committing to, do to it. it. It's great. Because if you just hold it in your head, You're I'm right. going to go work out. Right. What am I going to do? Oh, my fucking curls. Right. I don't know. Maybe I'll do some bench press. You, you need a structure You're so right. you can give it to yourself. You're right. 
That's awesome, man. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll do it in this documentary, and we'll come back, and I'm gonna show you that I'm next time you're here. I promise. You'll be looking for houses. I promise. We'll work out together. I love it. All right, my man. It's you're good to see you, brother. I you're love the you, best. man. You're I the love greatest. You too. Thank you for doing everything you're doing, man. My pleasure. You're it's, awesome. It's a lot of fun. It's great to see you out there killing it. I love it. <laughs> All right, bye, everybody. Thank you.